Very good day, a warm welcome to our discussion on the uh, impact of crisis on technologies and human capital management. Today, we'll focus on the manpower and we'll talk about how the pandemic impacted the teams of organizations in, in uh, business community and public sector. We'll talk about what managerial techniques stopped working efficiently and what the companies had to change to bring down the negative impact of the pandemic on people. They have the real professionals in management well aware of the importance of the teamwork for the overall success. Deputy Governor of the Nizhny Novgorod region, Mr. Tolmachov, Supervisory Board of the ECIG, and uh, Evgeny Chikin, Deputy Chairman of the Government of the Kamchatka, Kamchatka Territory. And we're expecting a person from the Schneider Electric, Maxim Agev, Vice President. So, uh, some housekeeping. We'll have the smart talk discussion today. That means that we'll not have lengthy interventions and reports, only the key points and exchanges, lively exchanges and best practices and pithy comments I expected from you. I'll be moderating that. My name is Alexei Shipov from the Ranipa Academy, the head of the Change Management Center. And uh, so off we go. We'll start with, uh, with the key assumption how the pandemic impacted the uh, human resources and any negative or positive comments in the first set of data. Please, uh, attention to the screen. Just note. During the 2020 crisis, we had surveys and there is the wear out, the burnout of 49% of the employees and the efficiency of the remote work went down according to 41% of employees and the key factors that impacted the reduction in efficiency is the burnout. 49% is the uh, anxiety and fear during the pandemic and part of the corporate traditions has been put on the back burner and many people lack that badly. Today we also invite the HR professional community to attend. They are streaming us online and they will be the active voters and poll participants that will help us shape the content for the discussion. These are HR professional for, professionals from business community and public administration and uh, I have the wizardry of the new technology in my smartphone that will help us poll. And please, the first poll, put it on the screen and uh, let it be visible for the speakers, if possible. So, what are we asking those that watch us online? What happened to your employees during the pandemic? No changes, reduced efficiency, reduced uh, agency and motivation, no no glaring eyes, uh, more productive or less productive, and we'll start the smart talk while they vote at this poll. So what happened to your employees and to your teams during the pandemic? And how would you characterize the main change with the people? I'll try to be lenient and democratic, just what, whoever wants, let him start. Alexei being the new participant of the debate. As a matter of fact, actually, what key changes have we seen? Schneider Electric is a, a commercial entity, organization, a private organization, and we have been using digital platforms and tools. We started our digital transformation journey long ago. The discovery of this year, of the past year, was as follows. All the developments that we previously had perceived 
to be necessarily physical, like meetings with clients and um, partner meetings and team action, team activities like the working groups meetings that required the physical presence, face-to-face -face format, we have been able to shift all those to the remote format without any major loss in efficiency. Despite the lockdown and all those restrictions and closed borders, still we organized our CEO meeting with the meeting of the CEO of Sibur and Pascal was in Hong Kong and Mr. Konov was in Moscow and still this virtual meeting took place and uh, business can operate remotely. Uh, yeah, we'll speak about changes later, but what happened to people? It's possible to operate. What changes have you noticed with people, with manpower, with employees? What happened to them? Have you seen any loss in efficiency, any fear, any anxiety? How the state of people changed? Well, the psycho psychologically, everybody was under pressure, no doubt. And uh, we heeded that. I mean, the the safety of our manpower. So, after all, it all began in March for our region, and everybody was frustrated, no one was sure where we were heading. And the key role there belonged to the management and the leadership of the company to provide clear communications and the sense of direction. So there was some psychological pressure and uh, the productivity went down, so they spent more time to accomplish same goals and tasks, but enthusiasm and motivation stayed as they were. All right, some uh, frustration and pressure and loss in pro productivity. But anyway, uh, agents and enthusiasm up, up to the expectations. Anatoly, a comment from you. You are a leader, a manager that pays a lot of attention on the team development. According to a major consultancy survey, with, during the remote work, efficiency goes down by 25% for individual tasks and 49% is the drop in the teamwork. Can you comment on that? What are your perceptions? Well, probably more or less these are true. We measured 29% for the first indicator. But anyway, any crisis is full of uh, challenges and opportunities at the same time. And we had to shift our approaches in dealing with the HR in public and private sectors. There arrived an understanding that all our region, the Nizhny Novgorod region, is a huge team of employees. Because all, all the municipal officers saw their load increase manifold over a short period of time, exponentially. So we have lengthy cycles and processes and you, uh, there is uh, little room for mistake, but uh, all of a sudden we had to act off the cuff and play by ear. And uh, the responsibility was with le the leaders, and uh, many of them became combat generals on duty, working round the clock without all those cumbersome procedures around. But some of the personnel, some part of the personnel was not able to work in crisis environment. Some of the people that don't believe them to be managers, top managers, uh, but subordinates, faced, uh, faced personal challenges and actually uh, in terms of digital technology and hardware we had a lot of constraints and pressure 
Although we had done something in advance, anyway, we had to act quickly and quicken up our pace. But you know, when an employee works remotely and his, his or her kids uh, study remotely, they only have one computer for their room. It is a very short conversation, a very long conversation. We can talk hours about that, but you know, we it, it took us a month or two in the spring to be able to rebound to the previous levels, although the efficiency anyway went down. Well, we felt to be in a single bundle all together, and the public uh, officials have this idea of commitment and dedication, although the teamwork suffered. But you know, in the top management, all the online capability and the Zoom meetups helped us accelerate things and the decision making is now done quicker and you can have meetups with the business community on a short notice. So, I mean, the top management uh, has become more efficient. Yes, I would emphasize that. Evgeny, what has happened to your personnel and uh, whether you think that the downside or the upside of the crisis prevailed? Well, anyway, I think that this crisis has become a stress test for the system with both positive and negative after effects. Among the downside, I would note the fact that with the public service, both for the top managers and the midline personnel, the main draw down, the downside was the vague prospects for the future and fear for the health of themselves and their families. And the role of the leaders, of the top managers, was was to ease up this anxiety and provide the protection for the whole of the employee team, adding up to the certainty of their and the second point is the clear-up of teams. Not all managers or employees have been able to adapt themselves and improve their efficiency in terms of efficiency and uh, results, now, uh, and outcomes of their work, part of the employees were on quarantine, others worked remotely, and uh, everybody's contribution to the teamwork came to the fore. Well, in the face-to-face -face format, you could not notice the efficiency of a specific employee, but remotely. It was evident uh, what every single employee was worth, and definitely the load went up, because the federal decisions were transmitted to us quite quickly and we had to generate some decisions and results and present them to Moscow. And, uh, the relevance of public support went up and more demand we saw from the business community and uh, the local communities from people on the ground. So, after all, what we saw was that part of our employees 
were not up to the mark and uh, we had a, a, a reshuffle in our team, an overhaul in our team. All right, very interesting. So we had uh, interesting polling results. The, the first option is that the psychological state of the employees worsened. Everybody noted the pressure, the psychological pressure, and the teamwork deteriorated, which uh, is a negative impact for any, any organization. Second, nothing changed or productivity went up. Well, probably this is the general uh, outcome of the whole year. So I, I made a survey among the executive authorities and I must note that those team and leaders that had been using remote formats and digital technology for a while were better prepared to measure all those improvements or deteriorations and that were better adapted to, to the new circumstances uh, while those who had worked in the traditional format with lots of paperwork and uh, red tape and manual operations, they, they, they chose the no change option in, in polling, while polling. So this is my opinion. So you will have to tell us how, how your managers, how your administrators adapted. And, uh, no initiative, no motivation. How have you been able to light your people up? I have a quick uh, clarification, question for clarification. Eugen mentioned the uncertainty among uh, employees, but everybody knows that when it all started, we believed it wouldn't last long, it would last for the t t till the May uh, holidays only. But you know, uh, a sprint race and a marathon are two different things, but it wasn't a short period anyway. We, di we didn't return quickly to the as-before state, but it, it turned out to be a marathon. And uh, I have a clarification question both to the business community and to the public authorities whether it was hard to transform the managerial practices and the behavior of the personnel to embrace the understanding that it will last long. It's going to be permanent for a while. No, we had to come up with a position and a perception. You mentioned this print and the marathon, but we didn't have an understanding back then. We didn't have any, any, any time to think about that, because it was a very hot period. And um, when you work in a company, you are responsible for the company, the employees, and then probably their families. But it's all about a company. But when you are a municipal officer or a public officer, you are responsible with your decisions. You will impact the lives and livelihoods of all the people in your vicinity, in your region. But at the same time, a municipal officer is a, a common person and not a rank-and-file citizen that also lacked understanding where we were heading at that time. And our HR team proved efficient and uh, we had been able to raise dedication with the personnel. And when we moved to the remote work format, we have been able to raise the efficiency and uh, we outsourced some of the HR functions and that helped us get braced and prepared and respond quick, quickly. And, uh, the decision-making and the, and the top-down communications were quite swift. That helped us a lot. But in a couple of months, we had 
more understanding, we, de we developed more understanding, and we figured that many of the functions that we had done on a daily basis before the pandemic, like lots of reports and presentations and uh, preparing for interventions, we figured that, our, uh, that it was not needed anymore, and the pandemic may impact the health and the safety of people, but we need all those tensions to transform our system, and I think that what happened in 2020 and is still lingering improved the public service and municipal service. I would like to ask the speakers and the colleagues, we're going to continue with this topic, but I would like to move on to block two because the time is pressing us. What are the sources of the negative impact of the pandemic, the organizational sources? Let's move on to block to what was lacking and what needed to be revisited in managerial processes, in HR processes. Could you please put the data we have gathered on the screen for our speakers and participants of the discussion. As you can see, almost 80% of Russian employees are not content with remote work, or at least they're not entirely comfortable with that. They feel that remote work is not as efficient as it could be. And there are certain factors that influence that. First, the factor connected to separating private life and work in time, but this is of course something related to self-discipline and we're going to look at it closer. And of course there are other factors which can be impacted by companies, by the government such as providing psychological support. And the most important thing is uh, the change in psychological contacts. So I would like to ask to launch the second poll for our participants online. We are asking them what has impacted negatively remote work, uh, lack of communication, or change of relations with colleagues, burnout of employees due to high stress and low level of ICT infrastructure development. So, a number of options you can choose, but I would like to pick up where uh, Mr. Tomachov ended. You said that you managed to retain the efficiency level. How did you manage to do that at Schneider Electric? You know. I do not think that I'm going to reveal something completely unexpected to you when I say that any organization serves a high purpose, and if it does so, then it unites people, it brings them together. And in our case, it was bringing people together, rallying them around our values, such as providing electricity and energy to critical infrastructure across the world. Schneider Electric assisted in building hospitals, in particular in Russia, using our equipment, and in Kazakhstan. So serving this purpose helped us rally together. And we also served the purposes of the company. It is a public company. Our company is listed on the stock exchange. And of course, we are cognizant of our responsibility to our shareholders. We have to do everything, do our best, demonstrate that our company is efficient and that we can compete despite the crisis and that despite the difficulties, we are still going forward. And it is indeed based on how a company copes in a crisis that people judge its efficiency. Yes, but we are talking about the sources of this negative sentiment people are having and here's some statistics according to the world experience the key reasons behind this negative sentiment are 
the disruption of uh, social ties. So corporate culture and values glue people together and they help weather through a crisis. So what about this communication in your company? Has it undergone some changes during the pandemic? Because I think, of course, remote work has impacted these processes. How did you cope with that? No doubt about that, Alexey. There were questions in particular about communication. I think communication is one of the key drivers that has an impact upon the efficiency of our company. Indeed, it was very difficult to set up this communication amid the pandemic. Of course, we used digital formats. We had done it before, but transitioning to digital entirely was a whole new challenge. We organized new formats such as uh, meetings of managers to share news from around the company across the world. Uh, how are we doing and where we're moving towards and we, we have to do that and we had to do that to understand where we are at and where we are moving to and all that to demonstrate that this is not the end of the world and the company has a future. And I think it helped us cope with the frustration everyone felt during the first weeks of the pandemic. Yes, and our participants online are very active still. Could you please uh, put on a video Evangelak from Kamchatka territory who is sharing his views on what impacted negatively the state of people. I think the most important reason for negative sentiments of employees is the fact that our employees do not know how to efficiently organize separating uh, their free time and uh, working time when they work remotely at home. They do not know how to set up their working place at home. They find it hard to self-motivate without any external source of motivation and of course uh, they're lacking in terms of planning and uh, setting the tasks and uh, accomplishing them and i think this lack of skill of working outside your customary workplace this is what had this negative impact on the efficiency of work. Yes, I think uh, the speakers have already highlighted that lack of skill at self-organizing is one of the factors we've got to take into account. And I think this is a competence that is very important. It has to be developed. Yes, I agree entirely. This is a very important competence. Lagging behind were the employees that could not self-organize. We have looked at super job polls and we conducted our own polls and research and we were astonished to find that 25 26% of people uh, said that they find it inconvenient to work at home because they were distracted by their families. But another 25% had been saying that they find it, found it comfortable to work at home. So there was a split. And there were some people who knew how to self-organize and others, no. And they didn't know how to do that. And uh, we mentioned the university, uh, and uh, one of the main goals of this uh, university it was set up was to help this self-organization, and we were paying a great deal of attention to lean technologies. Around 3,000 uh, public officers uh, learned these lean technologies, and even though it is only tangentially related to self-organization, still it was a huge boost, a huge help and people knew how to adapt processes very fast, how to adapt to new circumstances. And look at paper and uh, documents in paper and we know that older generations are usually accustomed to paper not to paperless uh, circulation and still we managed to achieve great headway in moving from paper going digital and 
Our team understood in general how it can adapt, how it can manage changes amid new realities. Thank you. Yevgeny, what do you think? What are the main sources, organizational sources of these negative sentiments? What are the main challenges Kamchatka Krai government is facing? I agree with a lot of what has been said here. I'm not going to add to that or expand on that, but looking at organizational reasons that brought about some internal stress among our employees, I can say that there was a lack of standardized processes based on digital technologies. They had not been there yet. We know the mindset of public officers, of municipal officers. The mindset requires a certain organization, a certain set of rules according to which they operate. So we can see that those ministries, those executive authorities that had experience of using digital communication, remote communication, were faster at adapting and more efficient at adapting. They set the pace and they transitioned to new forms of work very quickly. Whereas those ministries that stuck to traditional formats such as uh, paper, circulation, a lot of uh, personal meetings, collective decision-making, trying to avoid individual responsibility for their decisions. They were those that suffered the greatest stress and strain. And it's just a general observation. And secondly, indeed, we had not anticipated this need to go fully digital. Most or at least many government information systems were simply unprepared for employees migrating to the digital format. And, of course, it added to the strain on the employees themselves, and it also put greater strain on supporting services that had to do everything within a very short time span to set up a new form of work to help the employees migrate to the digital reality. And another thing that I already mentioned is a set of standard procedures, or rather black thereof. So it's important to have a set of rules and also prepare the institutions for such things. That is a very interesting thing. Can I add something? I just record that even before the pandemic, we had an assessment of 48 local teams, and they thought that they were underappreciated, they felt there was a lack of feedback, and they didn't understand what were their career prospects. What did we do? This summer we revisited those teams, we decided to provide them with a questionnaire once again, and we found that these anxieties had exacerbated. Employees were feeling even more underappreciated, they didn't have any idea of what their career prospects were, and of course there was lack of feedback as they felt. So these uh, factors only exacerbated during the pandemic, as we can see. That is very interesting to note. But now, before we move on to solutions, I would like to point out that you have all pointed out the digital factor because it's indispensable when organizing remote work. Let's have a 
look at the poll. Most people think that ICT infrastructure is not an important factor. They are not choosing it in this poll. The most important thing, according to them, is the growing burden on employees during the pandemic. What do you think? As far as burnout and stress levels are concerned, I often hear complaints that employees are very fatigued psychologically due to online conferences, and they think that their efficiency is far lower as compared to when they work in person and if there is a video conference uh, attended by more than seven people some employees think that this is just to tick the box and that it's really not that important just a formality yes uh, there are research papers on that and these research papers reveal that if there are many screens with people on the screen and if the background is blurred, all of that adds to the anxiety. So what, what do we see? We see that we had been developing digital before the pandemic. We, we, we thought that it was the panacea, it was the magic wand that would help us address any task, but it turns out that that's not the case. Well, there is a flip side to everything. We're going to pick that up, but for our speakers, I would like to put the latest data on the screen. Have a look at these trends of uh, changes in managing personnel, what changed, as you can see, Digitalization ranks first, and all the rest is lacking behind, far behind. And as you can see, that managerial culture and the social life of companies rank last. Interestingly, I would like to ask to launch the last poll for those who follow us online. We asked what changes in managing personnel were the most useful during the crisis. We're going to look at the answers a little later. On the one hand, some people think that digitalization is not that big of a deal. Others think that it's all about digitalization. So what do you think? What are the changes you have witnessed in motivating employees and managing your personnel? Yes, I fully disagree with those who think that digitalization was a bad thing. On the contrary, I think uh, it has been a huge boon. Right now, online, you can connect to any expert that can help you in making a decision right now, right here. At our university, we introduced online conferences very fast, very swiftly. Besides, it helps disseminate information among a wide audience. We, we know that small and medium enterprises had been suffering due to lack of information. But after the pandemic, we managed to connect them to online conferences and address the sore points. Before it had been impossible, it had taken months and months. Right now, it's far faster. Now, paper documentation is Another boon which helped us manage people remotely and organize our working processes. And we migrated to the digital and it's all digital right now, applications and all that. People have learned to work remotely, swiftly address any issues that arise. I think if it had happened the year before the previous one, we wouldn't have been so fast at learning these new processes. But it's true that most government systems are not yet prepared for working online. 
you, you had to thoughts too. You, you mentioned something about the competences and self-organization. You mentioned that it is very important. What about these competences? Is it going to be developed now? and Nizhny Novgorod, and uh, are you going to introduce some changes to managing HR? Yes, uh, that's true. Some think that HR is uh, just a side project and uh, that it doesn't de deserve attention, whereas in reality it's not true, and we've set up a single HR service, and it's right now a mainstream, and we are working with our partners, with Renipa in particular, addressing all things we need to address and managers uh, say that their employees have to learn self-organization and competencies that they are lacking to address the questions we are facing. And I think the pandemic has uh, pushed people towards more efficient learning. In the past, people simply uh, saw that as a formality. Right now, they have the need, the motivation to learn, to raise their motivations. This will create competitive environment probably in the market and people understand that they've got to develop their competences right now. Thank you. Just we have two videos to watch but unfortunately we'll not be able to make it because we're short of time. We'll sh show them in the social, on, on social media. We have only five minutes left and I'd like to learn from the speakers what else changed. The public authorities that had lagged behind in terms of digitalization, uh, have they changed? What, what do you make of that? Well, I, I would support Andrew in saying that the key change is the format of interaction between the uh, government and the authorities and the business sector and local communities, which is the most substantial change that we are witnessing in terms of efficiency of uh, remote teleconference meetings. We have made a huge leap forward in the public administration. All right, video, video teleconferences and what else? Digital document flow is number two. Uh, new software. So these two are the big drivers. Uh, of change in the public administration system. Look at the poll results. With narrow margin, the option was necessary to, ama to amend the regulations has the lead. Have there been made changes and amendments to, to the provisions of regulations? And uh, you said, Maxim, that safety was the top priority. Have you been able to put safety first? Well, we are lucky ones and we are an international, transnational company. We saw the Chinese experience. They were submerged in the pandemic uh, before everybody else and uh, we were quite swift, quick on the uptake to introduce all these measures, not waiting till it was imposed top-down uh, from the public administration uh, authorities. We have been able to put safety first. Right, we have three minutes left. Victor, can you, can you comment uh, this additional poll or in, uh, anything else and probably the final remarks will, would be pronounced by you? Well, a lot has been said about the technology and about the role of the leaders and the teams. What matters most is that now we feel the urgent need for that and the new technology is inevitable, its advent is inevitable. 
And now we are seeing more interest and more need for the new rules and regulations and technologies. And I think that the bottom line is uh, that we can run the marathon only if we are united by a single set of goals and have a shared perspective and moderate the HR community professionally. Having all those tenets that we share that will help us run the changes and manage the changes. Thank you. We are finalizing the discussion. I'd like to thank all the speakers, all the panelists, and I wish you every success in your fight against the COVID crisis. Thank you for your perspectives and visions. It was, I was pleased to hear that conclusions have been made and lessons have been learned. And anyway, we have been able to derive some benefit and increase our efficiency. Thank you, everybody attending and streaming us. Thank you. Goodbye. Изменились ли мы? Стали другими? Или остались собой? Принимая время, место, обстоятельства. Главное не остановиться сегодня, чтобы стать сильнее завтра. И знать, мы вместе. И это все меняет. Ваш Газпромбанк.
звуке или в тексте, ушами или глазами, но всегда мозгами. Только по делу. Главное в политике, главное в бизнесе, главное о личных деньгах. Со скоростью звука, со скоростью света. Услышать и увидеть. Один бренд, два адреса. Бизнес FM и bfm.ru не на словах, а на деле. В Российской Академии Народного Хозяйства и Государственной Службы при президенте Российской Федерации проходит Гайдаровский форум, который в начале года традиционно задает вектор общественной и научной дискуссии. Здесь собираются известные эксперты, представители органов власти, общественные и политические деятели, предприниматели из разных стран мира. Гайдаровский форум открывает обсуждение деловой повестки на ближайший год. Для гостей из-за рубежа форум выступает важным источником информации о главных тенденциях социально-экономического и политического развития, состояния бизнес-среды и инвестиционного климата России. В ходе открытых и плодотворных дискуссий участники форума смогут обменяться положительным опытом и лучшими мировыми практиками, предложить конструктивные подходы к решению приоритетных ключевых задач, стоящих перед Россией и миром на старте нового года, нового десятилетия. Ключевая тема форума этого года – Россия и мир после пандемии. Какие уроки мы извлекли с 2020 года, что нас ждет после пандемии и как мы можем подготовиться к этим изменениям? Станет ли дистанционная занятость будущей моделью рынка труда? Как ограничения и принятые в условиях пандемии законы повлияют на права и свободы граждан? Кто является реальным бенефициаром пандемии в долгосрочной перспективе, а также глобальные вызовы десятилетия и национальные приоритеты России? Эти и многие другие вопросы будут обсуждаться экспертами форума. Смотрите прямые трансляции 14 и 15 января. Россия и мир после пандемии. Гайдаровский форум. Не пропустите.
Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to greet all the participants of the Gaidar Forum. Traditionally, it is hosted right at the beginning of the year. It brings together experts to discuss the most relevant topics of the day. Today, the topic of the forum is Russia and the world after the pandemic. Governments across the world are looking for an answer what the world would look like after we fight back the new infection. This answer would define the long-term strategy in economy and for many social programs. We are coming to a head of the crisis caused by the coronavirus and I'm confident that the situation will get better from now on. The mass vaccination has started in earnest and it will provide protection and security for people across the country and across the world. This will help to thwart the factors that stymied the economic growth. Our country was the first to develop a vaccine and implement it efficiently. That is 
uh, the reason to say that we will restore quicker than average. Besides, our government had started a set of initiatives to support the economy and the people. That would be a part of the national plan. The goal is to bring the economy back to the sustained growth trajectory. So this year, 2021, we'll see the halved size of the discounted tax rate. It also provides for discounted interest rates for small business loans, which will will untap the opportunities for small businesses. We emphasized the socio-economic tasks, the support to families with children. They will be uh, the focus of our efforts for this year, too. These efforts are undergirded by the national strategy set forth by the President for the next 10 years. The plan of implementation, the roadmap, has been adopted and will be corrected for the next year. It will be readjusted. It couples and brings together many national programs. It stipulates for allocation of 39 billion rubles for the next three-year long period. And the same effort is underway for the state programs. The support institutes system is being readjusted. By doing so, we aim to increase the efficiency of state investments. After all, the July decree sets the deadline, the 2030, to achieve the goals that were established, but we are already uh, working in full swing to attain these goals. And all of these efforts are human-centered. All these efforts seek to improve the quality of life for citizens of our country. That includes the development of health care, support for education, improvement of housing conditions, protection of the environment, improving well-being and fighting poverty will be hinged upon the rise of the salaries and of the wages. This defines the household incomes. This is exactly the goal for improving the size of pensions and salaries. We need to boost the number of jobs with decent wages. And we intend to start the new investment cycle to achieve this goal. Uh, the Protection and Promotion of Investments Bill is already in full effect. Over, over two dozens of agreements in this, using this mechanism was struck last year across the pharmaceutical, medical and other industries. The aggregate size of these agreements is to the tune of one trillion. We intend now to move on to the digital contract system. This will provide broader access to this instrument for the business community, and we will continue promoting uh, the attraction of entrepreneurship in our country. We will continue improving the infrastructure, which are the enabling conditions for economic growth. The government has created a new mechanism for interacting with the business. The president instructed us to promote a reform of uh, control and oversight system, the so-called regulatory guillotine, and the business community was active in setting forth uh, the new requirements. A third of old regulations have been cancelled, and approximately 9,000 regulations, which were the vestige of the Soviet era, have been cancelled too. We are active in reforming the agricultural sector as we are set on track to effectively double the agro-export volume. We need to keep the inflation low and the borrowings level moderate. The inflation has overshoot the target corridor, but we hope that the next or this year we will go back to the target corridor and this will help us to stay on track for sustained economic growth. There is plenty 
work to be done. But the focus will always be on the rebound of the household incomes. Last year, our economy responded in a much more reserved manner to the coronavirus, and we are quick to restore this year. So this year we actually expect the positive figures of the economic growth. At the Gaidar Forum, the Digital Heights Award will be given to the solutions that were put together by the Russian developers. The active digitalization of many solutions has brought the IT sector to the forefront. It's one of the sectors with the biggest competitive edge. And now Russian IT experts compete with their foreign counterparts on an equal footing. Coronavirus has brought digital technology to every sphere of human life. So now the government is creating the so-called quote-unquote digital coffer program, which is a digital program for those who need it the most. It helps us to reach another national goal, to fight poverty. This mechanism will help us to act proactively and automatically put those in need on the payroll. This is a prompt procedure, just as we um, exactly as we did with you know, the health for families with children. No red tape at all. Remote work arrangements are on the rise, which is a clear consequence of the coronavirus and corona crisis. This spring, the 10 to 15 percent of all jobs were remote. And it's clear that this arrangement is here to stay, and this was factored in in the labor code, which was a significant development as we are dealing with significant developments on the labor market. And the existing legislation could not and did not factor in for these externalities. We know that new jobs will emerge in the new and innovative sectors. But the current practices show us that even the traditional and conventional sectors also see positive developments. During the lockdown, the remote working was uh, forced upon us. Now, though, it will be just an option for the employers to choose over different alternatives. The idea is to provide jobs and provide support to people who lost their jobs. During, um, the, uh, during the lockdown, we also need to fight the so-called grey sector of the economy and to increase the efficiency of the state governments. We need to move ourselves closer to the welfare state standard. We need to put all the services in place for citizens to be able to fully benefit from the systems, and they should be put in place by the beginning of April this year. The cap on the number of and bureaucrats will be put in place, will clearly define the responsibilities and avoid overlapping. It will be a concise, dense and compact state apparatus that will be much more efficient than before. We hope that it will make the quality of the decisions higher. It will bring us closer to the attainment of national development goals. The government is also focused on knowledge-intensive sectors such as AI, quantum technology, Internet of Things, new technologies and materials, and many, many others. We have road roadmaps for them, we have metrics, we have plans of implementation. We are also putting in place the centers of excellence that accumulate and promote the needed competences and knowledge. Taken all together, it accelerates the movement toward this technological track. 
Интеллектуальная The government is also implementing the roadmap on the transformation of business climate. We need to remove the unnecessary impediments and make the commercialization of the most advanced technologies easier. So from the one hand, we need to protect our intellectual property, but from the one hand, we also need to promote the creation of new unique technologies and solutions and bring them to the foreign markets. The strategy provides for an opportunity to respond to new challenges that might emerge in the next decade. We should not be held hostages to old paradigms, which are convenient, yes, but are not necessarily um, fit for purpose which is why we are readjusting the energy mix. Yes, oil and gas will be a major factor in it, but we cannot ignore and neglect the tectonic shifts in the global economy, which is crucial, a crucial thing for our economy. We need to make the economy diverse. We need to improve the petrochemical output. We need to link it together with the production of LNG and the boost in this production. Distinguished guests, this is not the only challenge that we are to respond in the coming years. And I am clear, clearly confident that the expert community will be able to provide its input along the way. We need to spare no effort to make our economy robust and strong. Guide our forum always, has always been and will always be a platform for new insights and I wish you an insightful and meaningful discussion. Thank you. Стали другими, 
или остались собой, принимая время, место, обстоятельства. Главное не остановиться сегодня, чтобы стать сильнее завтра и знать, мы вместе. И это все меняет. Ваш Газпромбанк. или в тексте, ушами или глазами, но всегда мозгами. Только по делу. Главное в политике, главное в бизнесе, главное о личных деньгах. Со скоростью звука, со скоростью света. Услышать и увидеть. Один бренд, два адреса. Бизнес FM и bfm.ru Не на словах, а на деле. Российской Академии Народного Хозяйства и Государственной Службы при президенте Российской Федерации проходит Гайдаровский форум, который в начале года традиционно задает вектор общественной и научной дискуссии. Здесь собираются известные эксперты, представители органов власти, общественные и политические деятели, предприниматели из разных стран мира. Гайдаровский форум открывает обсуждение деловой повестки на ближайший год. Для гостей из-за рубежа форум выступает важным источником информации о главных тенденциях социально-экономического и политического развития, состояния бизнес-среды и инвестиционного климата России. В ходе открытых и плодотворных дискуссий участники форума смогут обменяться положительным опытом и лучшими мировыми практиками, предложить конструктивные подходы к решению приоритетных ключевых задач, стоящих перед Россией и миром на старте нового года, нового десятилетия. Ключевая тема форума этого года – Россия и мир после пандемии. Какие уроки мы извлекли с 2020 года, что нас ждет после пандемии и как мы можем подготовиться к этим изменениям? Станет ли дистанционная занятость будущей моделью рынка труда? Как ограничения и принятые в условиях пандемии законы повлияют на права и свободы граждан? Кто является реальным бенефициаром пандемии в долгосрочной перспективе, а также глобальные вызовы десятилетия и национальные приоритеты России? 
Эти и многие другие вопросы будут обсуждаться экспертами форума. Смотрите прямые трансляции 14 и 15 января. Россия и мир после пандемии. Гайдаровский форум. Не пропустите.
Good afternoon, dear ladies, gentlemen, friends, colleagues. I'm glad to welcome everyone at the 12th annual Gaida Forum. Today, during our session, we are going to discuss issues related to the development of the Eurasian Economic Union. Even though we have already been introduced uh, in the video as a tradition, I'm going to introduce everyone personally. I'm going to moderate our today's discussion. My name is Sergei Sinelnikov. I am rector of the Russian uh, External Trade Academy. Joining us today in the studio are Mr. Ovechuk, Deputy Chair of the Government of the Russian Federation, and Mikhail Masnikovich, who chairs the board of the Eurasian Economic Commission. And Together, we are going to discuss the following issues today. First, what are the outcomes of the development of the Eurasian Economic Union so far? Secondly, what's its place in the world economic system? And the third issue, how precisely the Union is being managed and if anything needs to be changed. Now, as far as the first question is concerned, I think everyone is aware that 10 years ago a customs union was set up comprising Belarus, Kazakhstan and Russia in 2015. It transformed into the Eurasian Economic Union and it was joined uh, by Kyrgyzstan and Armenian, uh, Armenia. Absolutely correct, yes. So, for five years, the Union has been there. This single economic union had sought to achieve four freedoms. First, the freedom of movement of goods. According to experts, even though these vary, the movement of goods has been liberalized to the level of around 60 to 70 percent and the outcome of this liberalization is uncertain at the very beginning around 90 to 95 percent of all goods were supposed to be liberalized in terms of movement but Afterwards, exemptions were introduced after Kazakhstan joined the Union that was due to Kazakhstan's responsibilities and obligations inside the WTO. Apart from exemptions, we also have different national practices in classifying goods. So, in practice, different goods could be treated differently according to different classifications and the tariffs can vary accordingly. And there are other practices and such issues as precious metals and gems and alcohol and hazardous waste all of these issues have not yet been entirely resolved and this is something we're going to address in future another freedom is freedom of services it's 53 sectors so far most of them are business services construction travel services and the union also plans to cover another 5% by 2025 and put it on a single market. According to experts, we have achieved this level of freedom by around 45 to 50 percent. Another freedom is freedom of capital movement. According to experts, we have accomplished only 20 percent of the goal. And if we look at the concept of one single financial market endorsed in autumn 2019 only by 2025, the countries will have come up with uh, common approaches to building a unified financial market, so the processes are moving slowly. The last freedom is freedom of 
labor movement. Experts believe that around 70% of the gold has already been secured because no work permit is required any longer. A single taxation system has been introduced and other things have been accomplished to such as the recognition of documents, education and medical documents. I would very much like our speakers to dwell on these issues. The second question is related to the Union's relations to third countries. The share of the Union and the world GDP is 3.7% and it's been decreasing. It used to be 4.2% uh, in 2013, so the Union is advancing a little slower than the rest of the world. There is a separate question why this is happening. This is not the subject of our discussion today, but I cited this statistics because uh, mutual trade within the Union is several times less impressive than the trade of separate members of the Union with third countries, and the same goes for investment. Investment from third countries into the economies of the Union members is far superior to mutual investment that is flowing from one country of the Union to others. And we believe that the combination of uh, policies, the, 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 the alignment of policies inside the Union is also very important, but so far we see different approaches to the WTO among the members and to FTAs set up by separate members. To cite a famous example is the Russian embargo, the counter sanctions, and uh, some restrictions on uh, Ukrainian goods uh, that have been adopted by Russia but have not been adopted by some members of the Union. So this is yet another subject we could cover today. And the third block is managing the Union and a lot of issues have cropped up here. Experts have different proposals as to how exactly the management, the regulation have to be amendment. There is a proposal to provide the Eurasian Economic Commission with additional powers such as uh, supervising the uh, compliance and uh, the right to resort to courts if such violations do happen, the veto right, maybe the principle of uh, equitable representation has to be revisited. There are different proposals. And of course, uh, an important matter is the common budget of the Union, because uh, there are those who stand to benefit from decisions others can be the losers and if the veto right is there, it could prevent the Union from moving in certain directions. And if uh, someone stands to lose and someone stands to benefit, then the losing side has to be compensated and the mechanisms for that already exist, for example, in the European Union. The exemptions from the single tariff, that is another matter that needs discussion. Cussing. So I would like to ask our participants to touch upon these issues and to concentrate on them. But of course our discussion can go beyond what I've just mentioned. Mikhail, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for providing me with this opportunity to participate in this wonderful forum. I find it an emblematic event. It's the first time I take part in the Gaida Forum, even though it is well-renowned goes far beyond the borders of uh, participating countries. Thank you very much for introducing our discussion, for providing us with a bunch of questions to which I will provide answers. At least I'll try to, and I'll share my views. Yes. 
as of this day, we have to admit that the aggregate GDP of the Eurasian Economic Union as a relatively small share in the world GDP, 3.7% on average, but the potential that is hiding in the agreement on the Union allows us to raise this share significantly. We have had a look at this potential and we're doing everything in our power to develop our integration along the lines set in the strategy until 2025 then we will be able to raise import substitution by 20 by 10 to 12 percent and raise the exports non-commodity exports into third countries from our countries by 2025 percent so the potential is there. We see the problems that exist. We're trying to address them. And I would like to highlight that removing the bottlenecks is something we factor in into the strategic avenues for the development of the Union until 2025. The strategy has been adopted and endorsed by the heads of state on uh, December the 11th, 2020 at the summit. Right now the Commission is working to translate these goals into reality and to concrete steps. If we have a look at different areas of our cooperation, then we will see that there are many issues that can be addressed at the national level, <coughs> primarily in terms of technical regulation. Sometimes we do not have a sufficiently high level of internal trade. It stands at 60 to 70 billion US dollars annually, I mean the mutual trade, whereas our trade with third countries is uh, far greater, far superior to that. Why is that? First, a couple of words about the technical regulation. As of now, thanks to the technical regulations that we are implementing within the Union, 85% of our goods have already been certified and uh, unified technical norms. And this does not simply create trust. It means that the goods that are circulating in our internal markets and those that are exported are truly competitive globally, and this is a very good groundwork for us to make headway. Another thing we have not implemented so far is the harmonization of national legal system legislations. The national legislation of the EAEU member countries has to be harmonized on a mutual basis. And we also need harmonization between national legislations and the norms of the Union as a whole. Sometimes we see cases when national governments make decisions to protect their internal markets, to support internal domestic industries, which creates certain impediments to mutual trade. Sometimes, these decisions are taken under some patriotic pretenses to protect the sovereignty, but we have to understand that the main power of our union consists in our synergies and national complementarity of our national economies. And that is why it is very important to harmonize national legislations and the norms of the union. If this is done, then it's going to give us a great advantage. 
We also have to understand what, that we're lacking in goods that are highly competitive and that could be sold not just in our domestic market, but also in third countries. So the goal ahead of us is to set up joint ventures like uh, public companies uh, with shareholders that could be competitive and that could produce goods both to be consumed domestically and to be exported from the Union into the outside world. And this is an issue that is constantly in the spotlight of our leadership. And during the last session of the Eurasian Economic Union Council, President Vladimir Putin of Russia suggested that joint programs of import substitutions should be launched and he invited other members to participate in joint projects in such high technology industries as aircraft construction. So the political will is there. So at the level of the Commission, at the level of national governments, we have to give some thought to joining our efforts together so that we are nationally complementary and so that we can produce competitive goods. So far, the goods are not sufficient in numbers and not of sufficient quality so far. We have to admit that in some cases. So we've got to, to, to make sure our goods are of the same or better quality than German goods or Chinese goods that are worthy of investment. Of course, to achieve that, we need expertise, we need analysis, so that we do not simply waste money. We have to understand where and when to set up a company and what area of the market these companies have to be covered. If the goods are not going to be competitive, then there is no point in trying to funnel money into that because we will be simply wasting money. There are many good avenues and directions to pursue and the Council of our Commission, which is comprised of Deputy Prime Ministers and Alexei Odarchuk represents Russia and the Council, and the Council is often the platform for heated discussions that allow us to sort of crystallize the golden mean, the principles that will allow us to achieve synergy and to achieve and secure the place our union deserves in the world economy as an economic hub and center. And we will be very happy if the participants of the forum will give their proposals to us as to concretely what I Ideas, what initiatives could make it into this strategy. I think in the course of our discussion we'll touch upon other issues too, but that's it from me for now. Thank you, uh, Mr. Overture, please. A very good day, dear colleagues. Thank you so much, Mr. Snellnikov-Murilov, uh, for inviting me to attend this discussion. As always, you are being provocative in introducing the panelists, the speakers, which is good on the one hand, but you have been quite successful in providing the snapshot overview, I mean the current status of the Eurasian Economic Union, and you have been able to analyze the degree of integration of our five nations with respect to the four freedoms proclaimed during the establishment of the Union, and you scolded us for being too slow, and urged, you have urged us to speed up to overtake the European Union that is often viewed as the role model 
by other alliances worldwide. Actually, the figures you have provided testify to the fact that a lot has been achieved, accomplished, as regards bringing our nations and economies and markets together. As we are now ha having good numbers, and we have the track record of 10 years if we reckon the Eurasian, uh, the customs union, but uh, the Eurasian economic union is only five years old and a five-year-old child is only, only starts looking around. And this is what we have been doing. We have been looking around and, and at each other, trying to see what benefits each of the nations can derive from the membership in the Eurasian Economic Union, because all these debates in all the five nations are still underway, and uh, the decisions by the Council that are endorsed by the Commission are a follow-up on the debates inside those countries. And all the nations must be aware of the fact that everybody has their own expectations, like benefits, driving from access to the transport infrastructure, larger capacity markets, or integration of capital markets, or expectations that there will be an inflow of investments, or better conditions for the labor migrants at the destination country. This was what prompted countries to accede to the Union, which is normal. Today, we are talking about the fact that the year 2020, there was a hard one, doubtless. We can have the retrospective analysis of, of, of that period by period, and it had an impact on all the countries. A year ago, the government in the Russian Federation was ousted. Later, in late January, the reshuffle happened in the Eurasian Economic Commission, which had been expected, but anyway. Some additional tweaking was needed, and the pandemic arrived in March, and August the presidential election in Belarus followed. In September, we saw the flare-up of the Nagorno-Karabakh armed conflict. In October, the elections in Kyrgyzstan followed. It was a pre-election year for Kazakhstan, and all those Factors put together paint a, a backdrop that impacted all of us, but anyway, the outcome was quite decent because as a result of our discussions and talks we have accomplished the Union Development Strategy until 2025, and this paper this blueprint allows all of us to observe the in orderly manner, all the avenues and opportunities that lie ahead and that will allow the Union to make in terms of integration. We definitely what we want is to provide a favorable context for the single goods and services market. We also want a uniform set of rules and regulations 
в сферах нетарифного, технического, таможенного регулирования, мы бы хотели обеспечить прослеживаемость движения продукции, интеграции информационных систем стран-членов Союза, таможенного администрирования в области санитарного, фитосанитарного контроля, в области наглогового администрирования, начинаем вести. Мы бы хотели, конечно же, устранить изъятие Strike out all the exemptions and introduce the single customs tariff for the EU. This is what we see to do. But while discussing all these matters, I mean the uniform investment space and all other matters, we must assume what is the degree of readiness of our partners, I mean the member states. And the integration is possible to the extent that is acceptable to our partners. Сегодня хочет, чтобы у нас уже существовали общие рынки. Some of us want to see the common markets right now. Более высокого уровня. But quite often, these common markets require higher. Degree of integration. Интеграция именно экономических более высокого уровня интеграции. In terms of economy. Михаил Владимирович совершенно справедливо And, uh, говорит о том, что uh, необходимо странам uh, решиться передать часть своего суверенитета и смелее идти на страну and proceed with the supranational bodies. But different nations see that differently they may have their own perspective with respect to their place in the Union and the degree of integration. And uh, we must treat that with respect and see what is possible right now. I hope that confidence will be on the rise Естественно, это будет приводить к более интеграции, созданием наднациональных органов. Собственно, эти дискуссии с преобразованиями в институциональной части нашего Союза, связанные с преобразованиями в ЕЭК, что в последнее время у нас очень активно в подготовке стратегии. And we have been promoting all that while preparing the, the strategy blueprint and the mandatory nature of the rulings and verdicts of the Eurasian court is also a prerequisite. But all that requires consensus and the consensus matters are important for the Union because on the one hand консенсусные решения, они требуют гораздо больше принятия, и часто мы видим здесь эффективности, но с другой стороны идет учетное различных стран, но в то же время мы должны принять в учет, что это не такая большая экономика, в этом тоже есть определенные количества, которые дают союз some upside for, for the member states. And we noticed that more and more heed is paid to our union worldwide. It's in the spotlight. And uh, we're seeing that there are some positive trends with respect to the expansion of the union. Uzbekistan has received an observer status at the Union, as well as the Republic of Cuba. Irrespective of all the constraints 
relate to the pandemic. Dialogue is ongoing with the European Commission, as well as with the People's Republic of China, as part of coupling the Eurasian Economic Union and uh, the Belt and Road Initiative of China. All of that are important developments. They will never be speedy ones. You should not expect that, no. It cannot happen overnight. But still, the headway is there. And eventually, all of that will have the positive outcome. Another point to mention that is often neglected, unfortunately, but that is of paramount importance. It is about the human dimension of the Eurasian Economic Union. Sergei has said that we have performed best in integration in terms of labor market uh, progress. This is where we see the most tangible positive impact for people, the freedom of movement and more job opportunities, the 13% rate on Russian soil since the first day of your stay and relevant uh, similar conditions for Russian nationals in Belarus, Kyrgyzstan and other member states, which is important. What we should focus on, Mr. Mesnikovich, is uh, how we must bring benefits for people, for rank and file people, because our nationals should feel the advantages of, of their country being a part of the Union. And I don't want to say achievements there also. I must mention the digitalization programs. They are ongoing and uh, we have been advancing them inside the Union. The digital initiatives foundation has been set up by the Euro Eurasian Development Bank seeking to deliver specific projects that will benefit the people. And the people will know that this is a EAEU-driven process. And this trade name, the EAEU, will become part and parcel of people's everyday lives. And uh, as soon as we win the minds and the hearts of people, we'll get their support. It will be garnered. Well, you have accused me of being a provocateur. Let me, let me continue, unless you mind it, in a similar vein. I have a question to you and to Mikhail Mesnikovich. Fancy, it's the 17th forum in five years when the strategy that you have mentioned expires. So, if we take stock in five years, time just uh, fancy for a minute, what you would like to see implemented and delivered? Mikhail, uh, probably you will be the first. Well, first of all, I'd like to follow up on the ideas voiced by Mr. Olerchuk. As regards the governance, we must be aware that it is a union of independent sovereign nations, not a union state, no. And the work is, is done and performed to have the understanding that we facilitate accomplishing common goals 
проектом, который реализуется. Вот это вот взаимодополняемое, очень хорошо, что лидеры наших государств нацеливают нас постоянно. То есть политическая воля есть, инструменты через стратегию до 2025 года, нам надо в этом направлении двигаться. Давайте вот посмотрим, что будет через... Ближайшие пять лет или спрятаться. Смотрите, внешний код we'll у нас выстроен благодаря положенному кодексу. External perimeter is fixed И thanks to the customs code. Безусловно, будет соблюдаться. In the event that we stick to the uniform customs tariff, if the traceability system works well in a sound manner, we will not have major issues. But unfortunately now we're having lots of obstacles like barriers and exemptions and restrictions and some of the provisions that are yet to be settled at the intergovernmental legal level. In case we remove all those от того, что мы уже даже имеем. Благодаря внешнему устранению препятствий. Смотрите, in terms of the intra-union trade. Вот чем привлекательность еще можно сказать нашего союза? What is the upside? Я согласен с прозвучавшими оценками, что 2020 год был тяжелым годом и Возникали проблемы предсказуемости, то есть это нигде нельзя было прочесть ни в одном терминке, ни в одном терминке, ни в одном терминке, ни в одном терминке, ни в одном терминке. Но вот благодаря пониманию вот этого беда во многом сближала, и мы понимали решение, буквально что называется с колес, по тарифному и несанитарному регулированию, по регуляциям и медикальным товарам, внутреннем рынке и так далее. И это удавалось. И удавалось это во многом благодаря цифровизации. Ведь вот In no small part, that was because of the digitalization, and thanks to it, had it not been for the digital platforms, as imperfect as they are still, we wouldn't have been able to overcome all those problems, and we should make them even more sophisticated не только за счет to see our market fully operational and efficient. We should not rely on the administrative resource only. We should be able to produce more and more high-quality competitive goods and items for the domestic market of ours. And I am supportive of uh, of the idea and point by Mr. Overchuk that we should be loyal to rank and file people and uh, we should follow up on the national strategies now in member states and when our citizens and the young ones in particular feel the benefit we will be able to say that we have passed the point of no return the tipping point and we shouldn't be putting ashes on our head. The GDP drop was 3.4 percent, but in the European Union the drop was around 7 percent. Well, 3.4 is also a sensitive slump. Yes, indeed, it is quite tangible. And uh, another point to make. In 2024, the timeline for establishing a national market for goods to establish the common markets of power, gas, oil, and refined products. 
формируют основу структуры себестоимости вот в этом плане. И, безусловно, российская федерация which I praise in terms of tax administration, has been of help, uh, in particular with respect to indirect taxes. Russia is way ahead of other nations in this respect, and I, as I said, uh, your nation is like a spaceship, spacecraft, and uh, the national uh, taxation systems of Kazakhstan, Belarus, Kyrgyzstan, and Armenia are relatively competitive, but we need to align them. We should find common grounds to be able to come to terms on the indirect taxes and uh, interflows of capital, so we should be monitoring the goods and financial flows to, cons to, to improve and consolidate trust, both for the um, uh, public authorities and uh, rank-and-file people. Thank you. The thing is, we are running out of time. We have just five minutes left. But you have just mentioned, Mikhail, that Cuba and Tajikistan have become observers by 2025. Are they going to become members of the Union? Well, it is there you have to ask Uzbekistan and Cuba. But um, to start with, Uzbekistan is a country we're clo very close to us. Uh, culturally and historically, so regardless of how the member, potential membership is going to play out, we do hope Uzbekistan is going to become a member of the Union someday and all countries are going to support it, Russia is going to help and others are going to do their part and regardless of when and if that happens, uh, our economic systems are going to become closer, we're always going to be the biggest market for goods from Uzbekistan and as of now we see a significant increase in uh, trade with Uzbekistan even despite the pandemic and we have also created the most favorable conditions for promoting goods from Uzbekistan in the Russian market and we're closely working with Uzbekistan to bring closer our taxation systems. This is something we started back two years ago and we're going to continue with following this path and we're certainly going to assist Uzbekistan in everything related to aligning our customs systems, sanitary, epidemiological, control systems and to make sure that goods from Uzbekistan are in compliance with our standards and this will give them access to our market and I am hopeful that through this process of bringing our economies together we are going to sooner or later arrive and membership. As far as Uzbekistan is concerned, they are very actively engaged. I've already held meetings at the level of ambassador and deputy prime minister, and they have taken a keen interest in this project. And by the end of this year, we're going to submit a draft MOU and we'll start building a roadmap. If you'll allow me, I'll ask another question. During the first 10 years of this uh, millennium, we talked about a single space from Vladivostok to Lisbon. What about Greater Eurasian Partnership? Is it kind of like this idea? Because uh, it brings together spaces from the East and from the West, and the uh, One Belt, One Road initiative also fits in. So what do you think the changes are going to be in five years in that regard? We are working moving in this direction. Indeed, the Eurasian Partnership and the One Belt, One Road Initiative are emblematic documents, key documents. And in that regard, I believe we could first accomplish two global projects. The first project is the transportation project. And Russia is to play 
A significant role in this process. We, we need kind of a single coordinating body to manage this process, and it'll improve this transportation corridor from China to Europe and maybe North-South corridor. And another project is uh, Kazakhstan's initiative with regard to logistics centers, centers that could be used not just for domestically produced goods, but also for imported goods, primarily imports from China and from Europe. And what we are planning to do is to concentrate our attention on these two projects. As far as the first project is concerned, we are working together with the Russian Academy of Sciences that was charged by the President to look into this project. And we believe that these two areas could indeed be brought together based uh, on the road initiative in the next five years. We're running out of time. So, Mr. Ovechuk, the last question to you. What are the prospects? Well, look at the geographical map where Russia is, China is, and the rest of the countries are, and everything is going to become evident. What we need is a set of arrangements, of agreements that seek to promote goods without barriers, very smoothly. Well, that is just shortly what I think. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Overchuk, Mr. Nasnikovic. Thank you very much. So we've got a good discussion, and in five years we'll get back to this uh, conversation. Thank you. Bye. Стали другими или остались собой, принимая время.
Объезд. Обстоятельства. Главное не остановиться сегодня, чтобы стать сильнее завтра. И знать, мы вместе. И это все меняет. Ваш Газпромбанк. тексте ушами или глазами но всегда мозгами только по делу главное в политике главное в бизнесе главное о личных деньгах со скоростью звука со скоростью света услышать и увидеть один бренд два адреса бизнес fm и bfm ру не на словах а на деле Российской Академии Народного Хозяйства и Государственной Службы при президенте Российской Федерации проходит Гайдаровский форум, который в начале года традиционно задает вектор общественной и научной дискуссии. Здесь собираются известные эксперты, представители органов власти, общественные и политические деятели, предприниматели из разных стран мира. Гайдаровский форум открывает обсуждение деловой повестки на ближайший год. Для гостей из-за рубежа форум выступает важным источником информации о главных тенденциях социально-экономического и политического развития развития, состояния бизнес-среды и инвестиционного климата России. В ходе открытых и плодотворных дискуссий участники форума смогут обменяться положительным опытом и лучшими мировыми практиками, предложить конструктивные подходы к решению приоритетных ключевых задач, стоящих перед Россией и миром на старте нового года, нового десятилетия. Ключевая тема форума этого года – Россия и мир после пандемии. Какие уроки мы извлекли с 2020 года, что нас ждет после пандемии и как мы можем подготовиться к этим изменениям? Станет ли дистанционная занятость будущей моделью рынка труда? Как ограничения и принятые в условиях пандемии законы повлияют на права и свободы граждан? Кто является реальным бенефициаром пандемии в долгосрочной перспективе, а также глобальные вызовы десятилетия и национальные приоритеты России? Эти и многие другие вопросы будут обсуждаться экспертами форума. 
Смотрите прямые трансляции 14 и 15 января. Россия и мир после пандемии. Гайдаровский форум. Не пропустите.
Good afternoon. We'll start the debate HR for the regions. What and how should be taught at a time of change? My name is Alexei Komisarov. I I'm acting as a moderator of this session. Let me introduce the panelists first. Artyom Zdunov, uh, acting head of Mordovia at Interim, Sergei Vorobyov, president and the founder of the Ward Howell Company, as well as a professor of the Ron Higgs, uh, Ranipa Higher School of Public Nazarov, Management. Mr. Nazarov, Prime Minister of Bashkortostan, and Michael Rozvazhaev, Governor of Sevastopol, the city of Sevastopol, who will be with us online. Today the talk is rife about the fact that the world is undergoing a major change and the new requirements to the employees and the Working conditions come to the fore. There's a great deal of uh, new goals in training and teaching and education, and that is quite a conservative field, trailing the change, lagging behind. But today we'll talk what workers and human resources will be needed for the regions of, of this country. We'll start the talk with Mr. Razvozhaev. I, I hope you can see and hear us well and clear. We can see you quite well. Thank you for being with us online. My question to you would be, well, actually, the regional authorities look into the personnel training. But is it only about the future workers for the public authorities and municipalities and regional authorities? Or do you also care for business workers? and employees. What are the main issues, according to you? What is your perspective? The slogan and the title of the forum says it's a post-pandemic world, but we are still within this pandemic. We are not out of the woods yet. How all that impacts the personnel training? I can see and hear you well and clear. I thank you, Mr. Komisarov, dear colleagues. Greetings from from the hero city of Sevastopol. Unfortunately, I haven't been able to attend your meeting in person, but I think it is of importance to speak up my mind. We are amid the pandemic, not in the post-pandemic stage. So, this span of time shows the importance, paramount importance of personnel training. You are quite right, Mr. Komisarov, delivering your uh, introduction remarks that public administration matters a lot and uh, all those challenges that we faced last year set forth new challenges to the public administration system and the pace of decision making is a major challenge because we are living in the context of change and you could not apply any templates and previously approved schemes, although the public administration provides for clear cut planning and all of a sudden we had to assume responsibility and act off the cuff. Everybody starting from the government, governor and vice governor and down to the lowest ranks and being the orderer of the personnel training programs and careers.
curricula and taking into account the curricula of the RENIPA, which is the alma mater of many of the public officers. So being the orderers now, we are trying to reshape our requirements because we cannot now act within the paradigms that had been approved previously. The centrally planned decision-making, which is one thing, that probably is an extreme, another extreme is the uh, bottom-up decision-making. We need something in between. We need to see initiative at each and every level of the public administration, which is one of the takeaways of ours. As regards the need for personnel and the quality of personnel for the regions, what we need is people that will be able to reinforce the social and the economic spheres. In Sevastopol, we have defined the key development priorities in agriculture, it's wine making and vineyards development, as well as uh, shaping an IT cluster now. City. And uh, we also need to go digital and develop our IT sector because we don't have any mineral reserves. Another priority is the fishery clusters. We are a coastline city and uh, definitely we are translating that to to the Sevastopol public administration uh, university with respect to the wine growing and wine making we have a priority project and we train personnel in this sector and all the professions are embraced by us to match the order of uh, of the regional authorities for the sake of the, national, uh, the regional economy and its development. We have been shaping our own requirements to future human resources and future professionals. In closing, I want to come back to the human resources for public administration. It's obvious that modernizing the public service we should build upon the principles of responsibility, emotional intelligence, decision-making skills and swiftness in responding to the new challenges at all levels of the governmental and public administration machinery. And uh, last year, together with RENIPA, we carried out two events and came up with the curricula together with the governor's succession pool, who worked hard and uh, we added 50 more people to the, to the HR pool of our region as a result of last year's programs together with RENIPA. So these are the preliminary, preliminary conclusions with respect to training HR for regions. Thank you. Thank you. As a follow-up to your intervention, I have two questions. The first one. You have said that amid a pandemic, the public officers must be swift in decision-making, quick on the uptake. Is it something you may teach and learn, or is it about the makings? I think both of that. Primarily, we should be careful and attentive in selecting people, the proper people. And now, definitely, we are trying to bolster our HR potential. There are some of the inherent qualities and traits that predetermine human behavior. And we definitely will focus on these. But at the same time, we should provide correct and proper and pertinent trainings and education programs. And we should learn from our mistakes and from 
from the development and we should be engaged in continuous HR advanced training, build, building upon the experience that we gain. And second, you said that you are preparing uh, people together with the higher school over NEPA. You have been saying, well, everybody has been saying that the first year students in five years may find out that their profession will disappear. Well, uh, we definitely plan for, try to plan for 2030 or at least till 2035. And uh, bear in mind the state of the art technology. We try to project the development of our city and we try to find out what the strong points of ours are and we build upon those and uh, the forecasting and projection level of ours is decent and I hope we'll be able to, to see uh, relevant professionals graduating. Thank you. I hope you will be online with us because we may receive questions in the course of our round table. And I'd like to turn to Artyom Zdunov. Judging from what Mikhail has said and uh, judging by what uh, is the talk of the, of the day that you cannot change things alone and the collective action will be successful. Do, do, do you have any difficulties in team building? I know that you had a lot of action of that kind in Dagestan, although it is not a, a, a simple region. So what is your current status on that? Thank you. It is a, an interesting question. I, I know that everybody has been facing that. Team means confidence, and that takes time to build and develop. Some people are swift to join the team and become a full member. Others take longer. It all depends on the circumstances. And Mikhail has noted that of late we have seen an acceleration. And uh, the teams, the project teams, should be set up quicker. We do have difficulties and challenges. Well, all those centrifugal forces, centripetal rather, forces that shape around Moscow and St. Pete, they attract lots of human resources from, from the province, from the regions. But the regions should maintain the high level of their team quality. And uh, definitely the public authorities should also maintain a proper level of quality. And I'd like those education programs when we mix up federal, regional and municipal public administrators and officers, when we commingle them all together. And add business community representatives. This would be a breeding ground for for new champions. And uh, this is, I think, the most efficient approach. How to shape new teams? It's about uh, labor market supply and demand. I think today. We can see a lot of demand for professionals that know the second thing about uh, health care and medication supply and market specialists, marketing professionals and oversight of marketing also matters a lot. So we definitely should match these needs. 
Сейчас, наверное, да. Besides, I, I must say that today we don't require many years of track record in management or administration. And let me name specific people. We have the World of Flowers company in Mordovia, headed by Mr. Boldrev, Alexander Boldrev, for more than 15 years. And he was a graduate in the uh, city economy major. And now he has been doing a specialized, a specialist business, a narrow niche one. So, and you asked whether we should forecast relevant professions in 10 or 15 years. Well, we cannot fully project that. Let me take, tell another, give another example. Uh, a poultry, poultry breeding company headed by a former countryside history teacher who has been able to get elected as a, uh, as a regional lawmaker and he has been able to retrain himself and acquire and obtain new skills. There is definitely some deficit in high-quality personnel. We can eliminate it by being in close contact with, with organizations and companies and scouting for professionals. In Dagestan and Mordovia there is unemployment. At the same time there is huge demand for jobs. But at the same time major big enterprises face HR shortages. They lack professionals. One of the enterprises of ours turns out anti-COVID products and they need they are in want of more than 100 people to add to their payroll and uh, future workers must be incentivized to join this or that organization. Same refers to the agricultural processing companies. To attract people to come and work 20 kilometers away from their home, you should add some additional perks. So, on the one hand, we have unemployment, on the other hand, some many of the companies lack high-skilled and proper personnel. Another point that we should handle at the governmental, at the federal level, is as follows with the outflow of the migrants that used to work in construction who may face challenges in the sector. Just look at the professions occupied by the migrants. Those were probably military professionals related to the warfare and now we probably should retrain our own workers, our own servicemen so that they apply themselves in the civil sector. In the Republic of Mordovia we will reconsider the vocational and secondary education programs. So narrow niche uh, knowledge is something you always can obtain while going through an advanced training program. And the, the requirements to the public administration workers should not be lower than in the, in the business community and environment. Thank you. Thank you very much. It is so good that you know the situation on the ground quite well and you cited lots of companies. But coming back to your team, whom do you prefer to hire? Those having the track record of public service administration or the business community uh, track record? Both have their pros and cons. How, how uh, you view these two categories? No doubt. It is uh, more profitable, more advantageous to employ well-experienced people, people with technical education, mathematicians, physicists. They uh, adapt very quickly. They're very disciplined. And in Tatarstan, in Dagestan, in Mordovia, we've been working with these people. But truth be told, if a person 
is educated properly, if he is good at what he does, then it's going to be fine because management is more of an art than a science and for thousands of years the underlying principles remain the same. So the most important thing about a team is trust and swift decision making and in that sense Mikhail is absolutely apt at saying that. At the very beginning you mentioned medics, doctors, so would you employ as the head of a healthcare system, a wonderful doctor, or maybe you can be a very good doctor, be very well versed in medicine and be able to cure people and still be incapable of managing the whole of the health care system because there are many issues there that are not directly related to medicine purely. There are things related to HR, managing people. Certainly, who we need at this post is a specialist in the organizational field. But our healthcare minister is a practicing surgeon, but of course, managerial skills are of the utmost importance in this position. Thank you. Sergei, a question goes to you. I asked Mikhail about how exactly these people are to be dealt with who are swift decision makers uh, are they to be brought up and reared or are they to be found and employed you have got a very big experience in building regional teams so can you prepare a person that is going to be snatched away by heads of regions in your team building exercises well, uh, as Winnie the Pooh said, both things. Yes, there are people who simply won't make a decision, whatever you do. Selection as the basis of evolution is of the utmost importance. First, you've got to do the selection. And then in sports, whoever is selected, you still have to train, and the training has to be conducted properly. So first the selection, and then the training. So a huge thank you to the Academy of uh, Strategic Initiatives. I think it's going to be the sixth year in a row that we've been working with regional teams. And these are my favorite pupils. I'm not afraid to say that. I've always said that the public service is the ideal place to do some exploits, uh, do something heroic. But regional public service is even better than that in that regard. You know that, of course, uh, governors are powerful, but still there are municipalities with many powers, and there are federal representatives, and they all have to learn how to play together. And leadership and management always have to be put into a context, not just what you teach, but also how. And the questions have been piling up for tens of years, but the COVID-19 has changed all of that. So, you know this uh, K-shape graph. During a crisis, those who know how to work properly go upwards, and the rest go down. And this process has only been accelerated by the COVID pandemic, because everything is engulfed by uncertainty. And the digital technologies are sending all of that into an exponential trajectory. It has revealed everything, shown everything. Consultants like to simplify. That is why we've come up with a matrix of difficulty and pace. The pace has ticked up because of the uncertainty, the pace of the task you've got to address. The number has grown as well per unit of time. As a former physicist, thank you for the compliment. I've been thinking about that. What is the criterion of difficulty? A difficult task is a task you cannot solve on your own. And once it happens, you've got to rely on your team. And what does this team consist of? Of everyone. And it's not just horizontal cooperation, no. 
it's vertical, horizontal, it's in every dimension. If you don't know how to address a task, you've got to put everyone together. And this is the core skill, how to bring together a team that is going to play along, that is going to, to play together and help you overcome a difficult task. And this is the evolutionary path we've been pursuing over the last six years, and it's been great. So, if the new norm is that all tasks are difficult, and if they are becoming increasingly difficult, what are we to do? You know, I, I was taught at school that if you don't know how to solve difficult tasks, well, you'll have to do some menial labor, as my teacher used to tell me at school. But right now the thing is, all tasks are difficult, and you always have to come up against them, and you also have to, to, to learn team spirit. And also working in a team is the best way to learn further. And who wins now? The current strategy is that he who learns the fastest wins the most. And this is the imperative. The nature has shown it to us. And that is what we have to teach once uh, again, building a team. We, we have to do that at the highest level and at all other levels of leadership. And we've got to involve as many people as possible so that they would disseminate this practice further. So first, dozens of people and then hundreds of people. Yes, of course, so far, our teams are, are small so far, but we've got to reach this critical mass, like hundreds of uh, people. And digital technologies are a boon because they help us work online and if you work online you can learn online too and you can reach a never wider audience and I call this the R&D regime the regime of research and development as Socrates used to say well, the only thing I know is that I know little, and this is the motivating thing behind everything we do. We've got to learn as much as we know. Yes, any experience, any experiment implies errors, and our system is not that, you know, it doesn't look favorably at mistakes. Yes, that is a very good question. But the R&D regime requires and implies a shift of paradigm. So mistake is no longer a, mis uh, an, a foe, an adversary. It's a new norm of life. But of course, it's better if you can learn from your mistakes and make sure that you don't repeat the same ones again. But mm, mistakes are OK. And it is the conditions, public service in Russia and across the world has found itself in. So, Sergei, you, you, you mentioned some heroic deeds, and uh, yes, uh, it's been mentioned several times that public service is the best place for heroic deeds, but aren't you concerned that everything is only done through a heroic deed? Is there a task to teach public servants to work uh, routinely, like uh, uh, normally, uh, so that they don't have to mobilize all of a sudden when the deadline approaches, so that they don't have to, to do heroic deeds all the time to accomplish? Yes, thank you very much for pointing this out. Yes, uh, maybe I exaggerate a little bit. It's our national trait that we can only achieve anything through a heroic deed. Yes, let's let's uh, reformulate. It's the best place not for heroic deeds but for medals, for learning and teaching. And of course there are many people one can learn from others.
Sergey, and the final question to you. You are the head of a program, and many teams from regional leadership are studying there. Almost all regions have gone through this program. Are there some specifics in uh, different regions, or maybe the approaches and the methods are the same, regardless of whether that is a team from the Russian Far East or from the central part of Russia, from the Caucasus? Well, guys from the region, so I love you because you are neither made of glass or of bronze. And uh, yes, there are specifics, and these people, they are interested in learning. There are many problems they've got to come up against. They don't have uh, loads of money, they don't have automatic growth, and that is why they take a keen interest in this process. And that is the most important thing, when people want to learn. And yes, recently we've been very active at the selection process, we've been sending and dispatching letters to governors, and we choose the most motivated. And it's, it's great when people learn how to fly, because they are truly motivated. Andrei Gennadievich, a question to you, it's the same. How do you cope with uh, team building, with uh, building a managerial a leadership team in your region? And a sort of a sub-question, who do you prefer? Do you prefer more experienced specialists or maybe younger people? Because there is a trend towards uh, employing increasingly young people and unfortunately we see that people who are lacking experience, they make more mistakes. But they, however, have fresh opinions, a new look. Those who are more experienced don't make as many mistakes, but they're not as progressive, not as willing to engage in experiments. So this, what is the approach you espouse? Thank you, Mr. Karmisarov. Well, to start with your sub-question, I think it's formulated great. If you prepare a a person or a public servant in a traditional manner for a very long time to make sure he or she becomes a mature manager, then during these two decades or so, this person loses creativity, initiative, and other things that allow us to arrive at a very good result because he, he knows where the red lines are, he knows that initiative can be punishable sometimes and it stays within the box. Whereas if young people arrive at managerial positions from early on, they still manage to retain some creativity and this fresh mindset that is required to arrive at good solutions and accomplish goals. So a real team has to consist of both groups of people. They should be experts and there are also people who are designed to show initiative and creativity and there should be no imbalance. Due to the nature of my activities I had to move from one team uh, from one city or town to another and I also had to build a new team and I built a team engaging more experienced experts who know the territory, the, 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 the city and at the same time, and this especially relates to Moscow, to our capital, it means that these people reserve a certain part of their time for work, whereas people who you bring from the region, they devote ever more time to work. They have no time for the opera, for the theater. They devote themselves fully to their career to work and they are willing to work a lot to show initiative to show creativity and this also relates to experts to know people who come so when 
We build a team in Bashkortostan. We decided to revisit the old tool which we used to have. We, we had a system for strategic research and there was a, an open competition to, to get there and we, we had both experts getting in who are well versed in their fields and we also had people who are full of initiative and enthusiasm. And building these two elements and bringing them together helped us create a team which on the one hand accomplishes the goals, on the other hand comes up with creative ideas and solutions. So I would say that it's important to have a team that can work in a new paradigm and both knowledge has required on the one hand and initiative on the other. And this two-fold approach is very good at building teams. We know talented commanders and the armed forces who managed to make it to the top brass in a couple of years during a war. Of course, only talented ones managed to become truly great war commanders. So, only talented made it to the top. And that's what we see, too, in uh, our selection process. So we have many promising candidates, but some are more talented than the others, and they grow faster. And what about the pandemic? Do you think the pandemic is like the war, and it reveals the worst qualities and the best qualities like the war does? You know, we built two in hospitals for uh, treating infections. How much uh, does it take to, to build a, well, uh, a good hospital? Like a year for planning and another to, to, to build? And we built two hospitals this time. It took us 52 days to build one and the other 50 days. It seems impossible. But people built those hospitals, and uh, several thousand patients have already been treated at those hospitals. Aren't you concerned that what we discussed with Sergei is going to become the reality you built it? Maybe they're good, but some time will pass, and uh, procedures maybe have been broken, and uh, you're going to be reproached for that in several years. Yes, I wanted to touch upon that too. A heroic deed in public service is very dangerous, because if it's done with violations, with mistakes, the punishment will come and the price is going to be very high. So public service has no place for heroic deeds. You've got to work properly, you've got to accomplish the result without making a mistake. So it's a very delicate path, very difficult one to follow, but that is what you can do if you have the right team, if you've got well-versed public servants who know where the red lines are and on the one on the other hand when you have uh, initiate uh, full, people full of initiative they're young but yet they are also well-versed that's what we managed to do and that's how we managed to build those two hospitals we run the same processes in parallel sometimes it's a linear process you you do one thing then another and then another and let's take the, the, the construction, the production of um, manufacturing materials, licensing. If you do it in a linear fashion, then it takes 18 months minimum. But if you run processes simply in parallel and you've got thousands of people working on one platform, one is uh, doing the landscaping, the other one is uh, building the walls, others are doing the ventilation and others are doing the certification, then it helps shrink the process. 
That's the same in the armed forces. There are many different elements participating in the process. One is doing the reconnaissance, uh, the one is in planning, and so on and so forth. And the same here. So I cited these two hospitals were built during the pandemic, and we, we helped other regions. Uh, we were built a hospital for Chelyabinsk in uh, 74 days. Another outcome of this tool, you know, when we were built this tool back in 2006 uh, in Bashkortostan, I was the first to, to, to chair that tool, that body, and I came there from uh, private business, I was appointed, and I think it was a very good uh, tool, this uh, strategic foundation. It was a very good tool to build teams. At the federal level, we've got the Strategic Initiative Agency, which does basically the same thing. Thank you, Andrei Gennadievich. We've got a chance to ask a question that, come, uh, that has come from the Internet. I've got a question for Artyom Alekseevich from Irina Zlobina, from Izvestia of Mordovia. You're one of the first graduates of the Presidential Governors School. Have you thought at the graduation evening or night that you will become head of Mordovia Republic? Can you give an advice, a piece of advice to those youths that have not fulfilled themselves at home and flee the region? Well, probably uh, you should start with yourself, and now we have started shaping the HR or succession pool in our region. So my advice would be as follows. Please partake in that contest to fill in the positions in the, in the HR pool and acquire specific competences and look what goals are our priority and we'll work together with you. Just, uh, okay, thank you. I will now fire a quick question to all of the panelists and please provide a quick answer. Over the past difficult year, have you developed an idea what you personally are lacking and what skills and competences you would like to acquire. All of you keep training and learning continuously. But what is something, is there something that you lack? I think incident management is what we all lack. And the public authorities, officials, definitely must possess these skills. Quick on the uptake and quick to respond. This is what we should be. Michael. Alexei, I probably will say a queer thing, but I figured that you should learn to spare yourself and your people and your team, because we are no machines and we cannot work 24-7, but you know, you should uh, spare yourself and uh, distribute the goals and tasks and duties and uh, a question was asked about uh, the first year, the first set of graduates of the presidential school. Well, we obtained a lot of theoretical knowledge, but what we all need is practical implementation. We should be knowledgeable in, in distributing the resources and uh, we should be able to run this marathon and keep being efficient. Andrei, I want to mention one thing. You cannot uh, prepare an event unless you walk all the way through for all the stages. This is also true for all other things. I will interrupt you because we, we don't have much time. Okay, you know, uh, we had a traffic jam in our region and we changed the sign, the road signs, and the traffic disappeared as a result of our visit on the ground. So you should look at the things 
on a case-by-case basis, and you should keep learning. Sergei, we keep learning what we teach. This has been my overarching goal over the past year. The Nobel Prize for 2019 was given for random experimenting in social matters and welfare issues, and the business community should learn to find proper formats that expedite sorting the problems out. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our time has elapsed. I would like to thank all the panelists for attending, spending their time intervening while answering this quick-fire question. You recapped much of what we discussed during the workshop. We have uh, multifaceted issues and problems, and uh, we should learn incident management, and we should be people-centric, and we all should develop stamina and keep running and moderate our resources. Thank you. Thank you very much. See you soon. And our forum continues. Meanwhile, thank you. Стали другими или остались собой, принимая время, место, обстоятельства. Главное не остановиться сегодня, чтобы стать сильнее завтра и знать, мы вместе. И это все меняет. Ваш Газпромбанк.
звуке или в тексте, ушами или глазами, но всегда мозгами. Только по делу. Главное в политике. Главное в бизнесе. Главное о личных деньгах. Со скоростью звука. Со скоростью света. Услышать и увидеть. Один бренд, два адреса. Бизнес FM и bfm.ru Не на словах, а на деле. Российской Академии Народного Хозяйства и Государственной Службы при президенте Российской Федерации проходит Гайдаровский форум, который в начале года традиционно задает вектор общественной и научной дискуссии. Здесь собираются известные эксперты, представители органов власти, общественные и политические деятели, предприниматели из разных стран мира. Гайдаровский форум открывает обсуждение деловой повестки на ближайший год. Для гостей из-за рубежа форум выступает важным источником информации о главных тенденциях социально-экономического и политического развития, состояния бизнес-среды и инвестиционного климата России. В ходе открытых и плодотворных дискуссий участники форума смогут обменяться положительным опытом и лучшими мировыми практиками, предложить конструктивные подходы к решению приоритетных ключевых задач, стоящих перед Россией и миром на старте нового года, нового десятилетия. Ключевая тема форума этого года – Россия и мир после пандемии. Какие уроки мы извлекли с 2020 года, что нас ждет после пандемии и как мы можем подготовиться к этим изменениям? Станет ли дистанционная занятость будущей моделью рынка труда? Как ограничения и принятые в условиях пандемии законы повлияют на права и свободы граждан? Кто является реальным бенефициаром пандемии в долгосрочной перспективе, а также глобальные вызовы десятилетия и национальные приоритеты России? Эти и многие другие вопросы будут обсуждаться экспертами форума. Смотрите прямые трансляции 14 и 15 января. Россия и мир после пандемии. Гайдаровский форум. Не пропустите.
Good afternoon, distinguished participants and guests of the Gaida Forum. We are glad to welcome you at this presentation of the Center for Interdisciplinary Studies on Human Potential. On uh, October the 24th, 2018, a government decree was published on the provision of grants to leading scientific centers, and one of them has been the Center for Interdisciplinary Research, which is a consortium of four organizations, the heads of which are here with us today. Let me introduce them first. Mr. Yaroslav Kuzminov, Rector of the High School of Economics and National Research Institute. We also welcome the Rector of RENIPA, Mr. Vladimir Mao. Welcome. It gives me pleasure to introduce the Rector of Mgimo University, Mr. Anatoly Tokunov, and also the Director of Institute of Ethnology and Anthropology of the Russian Academy of Sciences, Mr. Dmitry Funk. Dmitry Anatolyevich, we are glad to welcome you. Of course, I welcome the participants and the guests, dear panelists. I would also like to welcome you and congratulate you on this huge event. It's emblematic. A great deal of work has already been done, but still much is ahead of you and ahead of the organizations that you are heads of. And we are going to talk about this because we are pressed for time. Unfortunately, we only have 45 minutes allocated for our session. We're going to talk about the center and what it's going to do. We are simply going to call it the center, if you don't mind. So my question is, why did you decide to join forces? On the one hand, it's good to work in a team, but on the other hand, it's difficult to to, to grow accustomed to working with one another. And could you also tell us about the name of the center and how the idea was born, uh, Mr. Kuzminov? Yes, the idea has been floated a long, uh, it was floated a long time ago, and it was part of our national strategy for supporting scientific and technological development. What's new is that for the first time, the uh, government has decided to support as a leading center, a center that specializes in humanitarian sciences, in humanities, in anthropology, and related scientists. It, it centers on a human being, on issues of social development, not on mathematics or physics. You see, traditionally, mathematics, physics, natural sciences have always been a part of Russia's advantages, competitive advantages to energy as well. And in that regard, our society has a sentiment that we are lagging behind in terms of social sciences, which is truly not the case. If you have a look at how sciences have been developing over the last 10 to 15 years, you'll see that Russia has done great strides, especially in social and humanitarian sciences. If you look at Russia's representation in the world, rankings in terms of uh, publications and the leading journals and magazines, you will see that apart from physics and mathematics, following them, social sciences have uh, moved to the forefront and they take up a significant share of our publications and humanities are not far behind. And this, to a large extent, is thanks to the teams we are heading. And I have to say that this process is not confined to the four institutions represented on this panel. There are many other universities and research centers uh, across our country. It is a wonderful example that attests to the fact that Russia can accomplish great things. And it's not that surprising. First and foremost, Russia is a well-developed country. It's a well-educated country. And 
Russia has been transitioning from an administrative, a planning economy, from an authoritarian society to a market-based economy, to a society based on this market economy and also on democratic principles. And this is a huge experience and this is a wonderful ground, soil for research by ethnic scientists, by anthropologists, by those who are involved in social sciences. This might come surprising, but it is only natural that we have done this. It was a logical step. Our organizations, our institutes, uh, our universities have been working for quite some time, our researchers, our scholars. Well, of course, it's not done at the rector level. It's not like Mr. Tolkanov and I are meeting and uh, I say, Anatoly, let's be friends. Well, of course, we, we can act as experts ourselves, not just as leaders of our respective institutions, but our scholars are doing the, the, the work and teams are set up, conferences are organized, workshops too, and our scholars are not just treating the works of one another. No, these teams have become increasingly intertwined, we learn from one another, which is an absolutely natural process. Vladimir Alexandrovich, uh, let me move on to you. I'm going to get back to our previous speakers too. What are the scholarly priorities of the center? Briefly, of course, given the depths of the matter at hand. Well, let me add to what Yaroslav Kuzminov has said. This is a project that has been born of our previously existing cooperation. It is not an artificial thing. As uh, teams, as scholars, we have been working not just as educational institutions. No, we have been carrying out research projects on different subjects. This consortium and this agenda seek to give uh, the solution in response to challenges the world is faced with, and they are manifold, they are multi-faceted, anthropological, energy-related, demographically related. So it's about a comprehensive study of humanity, and this is one of the most important priorities in uh, today's social sciences and scientists. Uh, to be more precise, we've got seven priorities and uh, more than 25 uh, big projects. The seven priorities are the following, the social and humanitarian dimension of human potential, demographics, employment, and the shaping of new competences and skills. When a crisis strikes, employment always moves to the forefront, starting from Marx and his understanding of employment throughout the 20th century and other works on that too. Now, the uh, human person during the era of technological transformation were at a juncture of drastic changes and this experience of the utmost importance. We cannot do without neurocognitive sciences and mechanisms of social behavior, environmental and climate factors, everything related to sustainable development. And the last thing is human potential in terms of security and safety in today's world. And safety and security are given the widest interpretation possible. There are different aspects like the military aspect, the man-made aspect, the natural aspect and all others. And I don't think I need to explain to you why these priorities, because uh, each is quite natural and behind each and every one there is a huge history, of course. Uh, Mr. Tolkanov, well, of course, it is a world-class research center, and I think that international cooperation is going to be one of the key areas of your work, how does it fit your agenda, especially given the 
global developments. First, I would like to once again highlight what Yaroslav Kuzminov has said. This uh, consortium is a wonderful uh, testimony uh, to institutional cooperation, cooperation of institutions working in education and science. And I think this is a very good example of groundwork for the future. It is a big project, and it also has a very deep international dimension, and that is well deserved, because the heads of these universities that are gathered here represent universities with a long history of international ties, and these ties are multifaceted too in terms of geographical scope, you can have a look at the screen, you see that it's more than 1,000 international agreements, more than 6,000 foreign students in our universities. There are 40 international laboratories. Annually, we hold up to 100 conferences, not just in Moscow or in the regions. We are also co-organizing conferences hosted by European and Asian countries, and of course, uh, throughout the CIS space, the former Soviet Union countries. Our teachers, our professors, our scholars are well-renowned experts at international organizations starting from the UN to the World Bank to other world organizations. And of course, I cannot but mention that foreign researchers make up up to 10% of our researchers and around 220 uh, foreign professors, but the practice will tell, are going to participate in this project. What I mean is that we have already fostered deep ties with foreign institutions and we're going to link them to this project. But at the initial stage, it's going to be around 45 universities from countries all over the world. In other words, I believe this project should have a very deep international dimension in terms of our soft power, in terms of promoting our social sciences and humanities. We often say that social scholars uh, owe a great debt to society and world community, maybe that's the case, and we are hopeful that this project, once implemented, is going to allow us to leap forward, far forward. Let me clarify what are the priorities in terms of promoting this institution and the global scope, the human potential or maybe some other priorities. What are the priorities for the nearest future? Well, first, we are going to bring together different platforms, the diplomatic, the social, humanitarian, and we've got three priorities. First, a human being and uh, countering uh, challenges to the stability of the world, global and geographical aspects of implementing human potential. Yes, each and every topic is of a global nature, given the challenges we're up against currently. Thank you very much. I'll get back to you now. Dmitry Anatolievich, your institute specializes in anthropological diversity. Could you clarify a little bit what are these factors of uh, resilience and diversity amid the world challenges. Thank you. I'm very glad that our institute has joined this consortium, accepting the kind invitation extended to us by the colleagues. It is of great importance. I'll just briefly underscore once again that bringing together university science and academic science is the model to emulate going forward. This is probably the best model to, to, to base our research on. Now, as far as anthropological diversity is concerned, I don't know what the associations, the readers 
uh, ordinary people, taxpayers, uh, spectators will have when they hear this uh, thing, anthropological diversity. But this is not biological diversity per se, physical diversity. There is a very good old term, ethnography, which uh, later came to be uh, replaced by ethnology. So we're talking about language, social, cultural diversity of humanity. Anthropology consists of several elements, social anthropology, biological anthropology, linguistic anthropology, however strange that may be, and there is also, I call it archaeology, that is the four element uh, model that we've had since the beginning of the 20th century all across the world. And this structure allows us to look into every little thing related to human existence, cultural or social forms that our life takes, that allows us to, to, to survive, to live, but we have a very wide look at it, at the whole globe, in all corners of the world, as far as Russia is concerned, we're looking at all the territories, at all the regions of our country, we're carrying out research, building maps, working with big data, comparing huge chunks of information, which in turns allows us not to get fixated on small things. It allows us, on the country, to give explanation to big, large-scale phenomena, why people are behaving like this in this situation, uh, during the stress, during a uh, time of social challenges. How do we explain that? And this is exactly what we seek to do and our activities. This is what the Institute has been doing for the last eight, nay, nine decades since its establishment. As far as uh, resilience is concerned, I'll allow myself a little joke. We're accustomed to thinking in large categories, as it were. We're trying to explain everything. In one go, this is how human mind works. If uh, you are too lazy to think, you want to come up with one single explanation that is going to explain away everything. And in the past, we tried to come up with a kind of a notion of Soviet nation, one single, unified, saying that unity is good. Now we came to believe that cultural, social diversity is magnificent, is something we need. Without denying or refuting either one or the other thing, or praising either the one or the other thing, I think this is one of the most important tasks right now our institute is confronted with. We are trying to, to, to find out what the link is between diversity on the one hand and resilience and sustainable development on the other. Across all territories, during all times, even during times of global challenges or other challenges, the same explanatory model is used. Usually, but it's not the case in reality. And if we try to, to, to tackle this task, find uh, a response to that, I think this is going to be a huge contribution on our part. Correct me if I'm wrong, thank you. But as far as I understand, the organizations you are heading, institutes and universities, are using the groundwork you, you've got because for, for decades, as we know, a great deal of work and research work too has been carried out. So you're not beginning from scratch. You're not building something that is completely new, that comes out of nowhere. Mr. Kuzminov, if I'm not mistaken, your university is working at resources, it has analytical systems for analyzing big data, IFORA, if I'm not mistaken, what other resources are you using to make this work more fruitful, more targeted, to, to raise its quality? How many more resources is going to be needed? to accomplish the tasks that you have voiced.
When you speak about a world-class center, you speak about two dimensions. The first is the academic product and uh, the ideas created by the researchers inside the center. And number two is the toolkit that is provided to the academia and researchers across the globe. Uh, in, in, well, primarily, in particular, those dealing with societies and economies in transition. We have several major tools now that are utilized broadly beyond the High School of Economics and RANIPA and the establishments that we represent. Most importantly, it's the Russian Longitudinal Household Survey carried out since 1993. We have accumulated and amassed a huge array of data that is in public access. Three to four PhD are defended, basing on that random longitudinal survey is a, an observation of a family over a time span. You know, it, it is real complicated. Uh, worldwide, there's only around 10 major longitudinal surveys. One of these is performed by us. Another tool is the archive of the sociological data that we have been maintaining for over a decade and that includes also data from the Soviet sociologists. These two tools have been recognized and acknowledged by the European Commission as mega-science <laughs> items, like synchrophositron, maybe uh, another example of a mega-science item. But you know, uh, social sciences also come into play. You mentioned the iFora system. In our presentation, we have a slide by them, by the way. Now they have 350 million documents on board in iFora. This is the first case ever when building upon the big data and neural networks, we start analyzing all the academic papers, course books, and articles. And a big number of companies order different types of research and surveys from iFora. And you can perform public sentiment research with the help of their data or study the efficiency of the laws. And number four is the Cognitive Science Center by Vasily Klyuchirov that now has won the international acclaim. They have a cluster of unique equipment and we have been actively contributing to that. We will definitely be, be leasing its potential and its capability to researchers from worldwide. Our colleagues have the archive and museum collection and pan-anthropological capability. The scale may be lower, but put together it comprises a major library in Ghana full of information for research at the regional level and other levels and want to make it available and accessible for all the Russian and international researchers so that they have free access to that, to the targets of their research. Vladimir Mao, a question to you, a clarification question. The breakthrough term has been cited and uh, breakthroughs in research and rapid results, as Vladimir has said, and Dmitry has also mentioned. So what are the results of the 
center, what level would mean a breakthrough in the, in the research and academic performance? What targets and goals do you have? Anything that would be spellbounding? worth a film or a book? Well, I would mind, most importantly, speaking about a silver bullet or a miracle or a magic wand. Oh, what a pity. Yeah, I, I'm kidding. Uh, me too. What we need is clear, transparent studies based on the data, evidence-based, and uh, we have unique institutes with unique teams of authors. We believe that potentially in this country and worldwide we see lots of demand for neurocognitive models as part of educational programs in sociology and social pathology. Leveling the inequality is another problem. Like we also recall the Karl Marx's work Capital, Chapter 24, when we speak about inequality. But today inequality is about the pace of economic growth, for example. We should stop politicizing the problem and uh, engage in uh, in-depth going research. And uh, another set of problems is about the economic growth, the low pace of growth, which is an endemic thing for many countries, mostly developed ones. So will it last long? Will it be permanent, or probably we should change the calculations methodology, or has the world depleted the growth model of today, and uh, we should be quite earnest in responding, and it should be evidence-based and big data-based, and it should be interdisciplinary at the end of the day. Today, at the forum, we had a session to discuss happiness. Is happiness an economic category? And uh, would it be correct to measure the dynamics of economic growth and everybody being unhappy at the same time? Or should everybody be happy instead? Is happiness measured by the economic or political metrics? All that merits digging down and looking into that. Well, measurements don't have a lot to do with breakthroughs. Now, by the way, our consortium has set as targets high parameters in top-notch international journals. So we should have more publications in these journals. Karl Marx said that a good theory is very practical, and uh, what we can offer will be used in practice, will be applied. Yes, thank you. Anatoly Dorkonov, a quick question to you. It has been mentioned that there is the concept of the soft power. Diplomats have been using it often. That is the talk of the day. Education is one of the important tools of soft power. Do you plan to unveil educational programs and new curricula and courses in your center? Yes, sure, definitely. We will develop educational programs and following up on my uh, colleague, the, the previous speaker's point, I, I must say that we hope to resolve lots of issues in social development and human capital development. 
And I'd like to cite, to quote uh, uh, the song of our youth, that the science has no beginning and no end, as well as life. So we are in the mainstream, I believe. Still, we will be able to make our modest but weighty contribution to global science, in this domain at least. As regards education programs, we will forge new educational programs, around 38 of them, which will be a 30% coverage in terms of the young researchers and students in all the domains. We have the masters and bachelors programs for promising majors in human capital and human potential development, then programs that will allow for breakthrough in results in academic and research domains and other international, international, I emphasize, programs. And both Russian and foreign lecture, lecturers will be teaching there. What matters for us is also the regional domain. And uh, our center has offices and outlets in 54 regions of the Russian Federation and the High School of Economics and GIMO University has lots of offices and centers across the country. That will be instrumental to multiply the efficiency of our research and uh, we will engage regional colleagues to our work. CIS also, yes, the CIS nations also will participate. This is one of the important goals of ours related to the international dimension. And I think that we are also delivering a new project quite promising. The new methodology of studying political and business elites that will help us look at the developments, current developments in the CIS countries. That matters a lot for us to ensure our security, safety and economic development. Dmitry Anatolievich, why do you think that interdisciplinary dimension is of so much importance for the current anthropology. Thank you for your pertinent question. I'll probably start with the end, with the second part, as regards the anthropology. Everything that has been raised and brought up by the colleagues today about the development of science and education are overarchingly important things. They are important for anthropology in this country as well. That has been around for more than 100 years globally. Us in this country over the past 25 years has made a giant leap forward. Well, it is our lot. We, we trail and then we leap forward and then we trail again. So uh, this is typical of our society and about, uh, of the anthropology as well. Back in 2020, uh, in 1920s and 1930s, we were on par with others. Currently, the main objective of the socio-cultural anthropology with all the spin-offs and branches of biological and linguistic anthropology is to be able to organize the educational system in such a way that it would allow us in the forthcoming five to seven years to train people that would be capable of teaching and forging international ties and sorting out a huge 
tangle of problems that today's society is faced with. Well, you should be able to describe the birch bark footwear, traditional birch bark footwear, lapti. That is typical of our culture, and you should at the same time be able to look into conflicts, different types of conflicts, and anthropologists should act as mediators or middlemen with respect to economic development or some of the decisions that are made. We have a role to play there. And we should do that. And how, how to play this role? Okay, in this case, uh, let me proceed with the first part of the question and talk about in the interdisciplinary nature. It is a vulnerable, weak term, because the definition is not clear at this point. In our sciences, to a no less extent than in physics, bio biology, and other natural sciences, we have specializations and a breakdown of these, and we stop speaking one the same language all of a sudden. And the more we try to explain things to one another, the better and the more fruitful our synergies will be. We should have some common ground, but there is another thing I want to mention, if you allow me just a minute. No more. All types of research are specific. We often use the street light effect. When a, a drunkard is fumbling for the keys under, under a street lantern because you can see it better in that, in that limelight. We'll look at the professionals, specialists, but as soon as we find something outside that light spot and try to resolve that, we may have this breakthrough. Thank you. We still have several minutes till the end. So the finalizing question, we have been talking the human potential. The HR is a major driver, we all know that. Are, are there performers of those goals, people that will be able to deliver? We have lots of talented, clever, profound people that could do that. Do we have a shortage of personnel to match the global goals of your center? If so, how are you going to resolve that? We know that personnel shortage has been endemic for this country's science. I'm looking at you, Dmitry. Yes, thank you. I'm nodding. The answer is yes. We have able and capable people that can steward us through. And uh, still we have some shortage, and uh, otherwise we wouldn't have established the consortium. We cannot live on our own in isolation. <laughs> Four major establishments cannot live in vacuum. We need international staff, and we need to train new staff that will become part of, of our teams and inject fresh mental blood. So, can, uh, will you add, please, <laughs> Mr. Tolkunov, well, well, we'll be able to breed our own champions, our own talents, and we can see that in our post uh, master's uh, courses we have lots of talented people and uh, 
we definitely interact with our international colleagues and rely on their best practices. And uh, I think that in this in this respect we have overcome the difficulties. Vladimir, what about the the personnel? It's always difficult. Yes, it's difficult, but easy at the same time. We need talented people who want to learn more and to, to learn well and to work more and to work much. So the best universities are not the ones where they teach well, but the ones that attract those who know how to, to, to learn. It's a cycle, it's chemistry, it's a very delicate matter, it's all very subtle. I'm always uh, talking about Marx and you quote Stalin, the uh, staff is everything. No, 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 there is no politics involved, I'm just saying that as a historian of uh, economy. It's about the issue of attractiveness. If there is a good project, the good employees, good specialists are going to come. And uh, one, the like flock to the like. You, smart people go to other smart people, so the most important thing is to prevent uh, any barriers in that regard. <laughs> Mr. Kuzminov, what do you think? I'm afraid to, of making any more quotes lest I should be caught on that. You know, times have changed. We are constantly talking about shortages of people, of personnel. But the nature of this shortage has changed. We see that our computer sciences, uh, physicists, engineers, have a constant dearth of people who could come to doctorate studies because uh, there are not enough well, they're specialists, but it's uh, different with uh, social sciences. You're not as much tied up uh, in one laboratory. You can work uh, at a big university, be that in Moscow, in Boston, and it has uh, developed all across the country. We see huge upsurge in the quality of people who want to, to, to work, to, to do science, some scholarly work uh, uh, in Moscow, in Vladivostok, and in social sciences and humanities, it's felt more than in uh, natural sciences. And I think we've got to take advantage of that. Thank you very much. We are running out of time. The only thing that is left for me to do is to thank our panelists. We have held a session entitled the presentation of the Center for Interdisciplinary Research on Human Potential. We're going to closely follow the successes of the center, the preliminary results uh, and the breakthrough it is bound to achieve. I would like to thank the panelists and also all the uh, audience uh, follow the guide forum program our session is over thank you
изменились ли мы? Стали другими или остались собой? Принимая время, место, обстоятельства. Главное не остановиться сегодня, чтобы стать сильнее завтра. И знать, мы вместе. И это все меняет. Ваш Газпромбанк. или в тексте, ушами или глазами, но всегда мозгами. Только по делу. Главное в политике, главное в бизнесе, главное о личных деньгах. Со скоростью звука, со скоростью света. Услышать и увидеть. Один бренд, два адреса. Бизнес FM и bfm.ru Не на словах, а на деле. В Российской Академии Народного Хозяйства и Государственной Службы при президенте Российской Федерации проходит Гайдаровский форум, который в начале года традиционно задает вектор общественной и научной дискуссии. Здесь собираются известные эксперты, представители органов власти, общественные и политические деятели, предприниматели из разных стран мира. Гайдаровский форум открывает обсуждение деловой повестки на ближайший год. Для гостей из-за рубежа форум выступает важным источником информации о главных тенденциях социально-экономического и политического развития, состояния бизнес-среды и инвестиционного климата России. В ходе открытых и плодотворных дискуссий участники форума смогут обменяться положительным опытом и лучшими мировыми практиками, предложить конструктивные подходы к решению приоритетных ключевых задач, стоящих перед Россией и миром на старте нового года, нового десятилетия. Ключевая тема форума этого года – Россия и мир после пандемии. Какие уроки мы извлекли с 2020 года, что нас ждет после пандемии и как мы можем подготовиться к этим изменениям? Станет ли дистанционная занятость будущей моделью рынка труда? Как ограничения и принятые в условиях пандемии законы повлияют на права и свободы граждан? 
кто является реальным бенефициаром пандемии в долгосрочной перспективе, а также глобальные вызовы десятилетия и национальные приоритеты России. Эти и многие другие вопросы будут обсуждаться экспертами форума. Смотрите прямые трансляции 14 и 15 января «Россия и мир после пандемии». Гайдаровский форум. Не пропустите.
Здравствуйте. Мы Hello. We start our roundtable humans in the post-COVID world. Uh, a bit of housekeeping. We'll listen to four short interventions by for most people. I'll introduce them once again before they speak, and later we'll have a short discussion on the title of today's roundtable, Humans in the Post-Covid World, and we'll ask each other questions and we'll try to accentuate this very important and emotionally charged topic. So, off we go. First, to intervene will be Yulia Ovcharova, Vice Rector of the High School of Economics. A very good afternoon, dear participants. This year, Gaidar's forum discussions revolve around the matters set forth by the pandemics before the world, before each and every nation and each and every family. Despite all the difficulties of the past year, I rejoice today. Why so? Because I introduced my intervention at a round table organized by the Center for Interdisciplinary Research for Human Potential, established by four research organizations. organizations. It is a network center with a grant for five years from the uh, Education and Science Ministry. We'll, have, we'll be developing a world-class center in social life and humanity. Confucius will be the underlying point of my speech today. We all know the first quote, I wish our enemies, all our enemies to live at a time of change. Another quote by him, that we shouldn't be afraid of change, is also well known, because the changes happen when and as necessary. This will be my conceptual framework for my report on how the pandemic impacted Russian households. And where does the social and welfare policy come into play? I'll rely on the research of the Social Policy Institute of the High School of Economics that I had. When we speak about the economic impact for the households, it's mostly about livelihoods and employment. In October 2020, we had a survey, and this is how families assessed their livelihood. 35% of families believe that their income has dropped. Mostly Moscow residents said that for the first time for a long time. That was said in September and October, not in May or June, which means that the economy was rebounding at a slow pace and people had lost jobs or their salaries had gone down or there probably had been arrears in salary payments. What increased and augmented the economic risks? and was served as a protection. Let's start with the risks. We have a breakdown of three types of risks. First of all, those who were employed in private services like restaurants, tourism and sales, although recently that was a token of success belonging to that bundle of industries. Then unofficial employment, with around 35 million people working informally. But this probably was not the sole in income source for them. Only for 7 million people it was the sole income source. And the third bracket was the small enterprise employees and owners that faced major restrictions. So what was the protection factors? Number one, an official contract. Even if they lost a job, 
they received uh, a dole and a, a formidable package of support then. The second was working in a major company or in the public sector. And the third success factor was being part of the IT sector, having digital competences and track record of remote work. I want to focus on the fact that the IT competences, digital competences and the result-oriented work are becoming a key factor of the new inequality as well as a factor of success. The governmental backing looks as follows. Let me start with citing the uh, proportions of measures uh, to GDP to support their people. Rich countries spend more money to support their people and back the economy. Many researchers say that during the pandemic, the social policies became an important factor of macroeconomic stability. The Russian Federation is in the mid-spending group of countries. They can single out four national trends. First is helicopter money. Second, preserving employment and trying to prop up uh, the rates of uh, employment. Third, support measures that are time-tested. And fourth, the start of planned but new measures. For Russia, the fourth trajectory was opted. New measures to support families with children were introduced earlier than we had planned before. We started earlier, and as a result, 59% of Russian families received no support, according to our survey in October, and 28% said they didn't expect any any support from the, from the government. It was via children that families received support. Second, in terms of importance, was the uh, unemployed support. 68% of businessmen expected support from the government and uh, a tiny proportion received. The fact that uh, no adequate support was given to them impacted the sentiment of people and their political views. In 2018, the biggest chunk of population believed that the poorest should be supported. In 2020, most people believed that those who have borne the brunt and suffered should receive the support, not the poorest ones. Entrepreneurs and small enterprises suffered most and uh, this is the public consensus now. Prior to that, the population never noted the problems of the businessmen. Now, in, in conclusion, I'll speak about the problems of the middle class. I will not tell you whom we believe to be uh, middle class representatives. We believe these are highly educated, well-to-do workers and those who associate themselves to be part of the middle class. All these factors must be put together. 26 to 29 percent of the population is the overall score of the middle class. And we made an in-depth study of that income bracket, social bracket, and as a result we, we figured out that not everybody changed their consumption models. Many people had buffers and savings, but for the first time since 2020, a major chunk of the middle class shifted to the poor class. 
этой группы пострадавших over the proto made class a proto poor people for many people what was a considerable crucial fact a dramatic fact was the shrinkage of their business or a shutdown of their business will that entail the new social institutions like the unconditional income or virtual practices we do not know that the unconditional income concept appeared as a response to the aging population and growth of inequality. The social policies are becoming a fact of macroeconomic stability and new forms of unemployment and new forms of inequality appeared. And definitely that will push the government to shove and to introduce the unconditional income hour. Scientists will study that in an in-depth fashion for the forthcoming five years. Thank you. Thank you for the first, the first speaker. And our second panelist is Sergei Zuev, director of the social sciences of RENIPA. The correlation between the technology platforms and the public confidence and trust is not a new thing to discuss. Technology optimists and pessimists and the paradoxes of public confidence is something that is not a new to us. And we have been studying that form. And the perception of the technology being the critical factor in transformation and large and small social structures and uh, the concept of social trust and everyday technology practices have been studied by the Eurobarometer project in this country since 2012. Over the past years we have seen major changes. However, against this technological backdrop, the Hobbemas, Jürgen Hobbemas point that apart from two basic types of resources, which are power and capital. A third one is coming to the fore that is called the social trust. Is now becoming relevant as never before. And we are seeing historically rapid progress. In 2012, the technology agenda was not fully set and determined, and the attitudes towards technology was not part of the basic mindset patterns and uh, back then it was about the everyday practices and we dealt with and spoke about declarations and economic and political slogans and expectations that are mythical sometimes in their nature in their essence Progressions also were on time the agenda. By 2017, according to our measurements, the new technology are something akin to the new ideology. It is uh, a sleek mindset optimism demonstrated and posted by 42%. In the forthcoming future, the S&T progress will sort out all the major issues for the humankind. Technology indicators and levels in Russia are the lowest in Europe. By 2017 and 2018, we saw that the confidence and trust with specific innovations was on, were on the right, like a manless cars and a robot surgeon, a robot judge and others. And those indicators had no relationship to the general technology optimism. Uh, the bracket of people, the category of people that did not believe in the scientific progress still laid hope and pinned hope on, uh, uh, on robots, like in general. They didn't trust the science and technology progress, but they were fascinated by specific 
solutions and achievements and technologies. And the new technologies won the votes of those who did not trust political institutions. For example, from 2016 to 2018, the confidence with courts went down by 8%, and the confidence and trust with a Robot judge went up by 6%. This is a curious correlation. Trust with a small group correlated positively and directly with the fall in the overall trust to public institutions. So, interperson confidence and trust was on the rise, as well as trust with the technology. These were local groups of interest and clubs, technology optimism being the inherent trait. And, uh, it was kind of a social escapism, and the, the crystallization of the public, negative public and critical public sentiment, skeptic sentiment. Back then, the new technology agenda went to the fore, came to the fore, correlating closely with the trust with public institutions. The question about where the new technologies would be applied, public administration is the most popular option and rendering public services to people. Technology is considered as a medicine, a remedy to cure the imperfect practices in uh, public administration. And there's a correlation with the level of education, by the way, which is obvious from the slide. Things changed dramatically in 2019. The parameters of technology, optimism, general or declarative optimism, went down, and the trust with specific technologies remained unchanged or, or even grew slightly marginally, especially towards a robo judge. In 2020, that trend was further accelerated and the hopes for science and technology progress by and large went down, but still the hopes pinned uh, on specific solutions were maintained and persisted, and technology fears kept growing, for example, like this. The number of respondents who answered that I may, I'm afraid I may lose my job because of the AI went up considerably from 8 to 26 percent. Although it is away below the European levels of 53 percent of those who fear the AI may deprive them of job, or in the US, 72 percent of people fear losing a job because of the AI. In our country, it's only 26, but growing rapidly. The sobering effect of the 2020 will persist in the forthcoming years, and the declarative Te technology optimism will also be declining, will keep declining, and technology fears will be on the rise. In previous periods, technology was an antonym to, to government, to state, and the dissatisfied people pinned hope on that. Those unhappy with the public administration system currently on on the contrary, a technology is perceived to be a follow-up on the public machinery, a part and parcel of the governmental machinery, and uh, new technology phobias will come to the fore, will emerge, will be able to verify that no earlier than in late 2021, but uh, over the past eight years, we may state that the technology novelties to this or that extent to different levels and types of trust 
and it's not just about formal restrictions on different types of communications. It is a factor which has a substantive influence upon trust in the one sense of the wide sense of the world in current social structures. Thank you. And our third speaker is Andrei Baikov, Prorector of Mgimo. The current planetary system is a conglomerate which is very diverse and multifaceted. And there are different narratives which are not exhausted by the traditional slew of intergovernmental relations. There are many aspects, technological, energy, and all of that, but not limited to that. And we see a transformation of the state institutions, social society, the state itself, which is based upon legitimate representation of society and also legitimate use of force, tries to survive amid the new trends of transnationalism and civic activism. And in that regard, the state is trying to show its role and and relevance in society, and it tries to counter the narrative which brings to naught or invalidates intergovernmental relations as the primary form of international relations. In that regard, the state has, assume, has to assume new roles, new functions. It has to show that it can tap into the potential of each and every individual and society due to its resources, taxes, and its experience. In other words, the state, the government, has to balance, on the one hand, as the great arbiter, the referee, and on the other hand, a institution that has to help each and every society. So, yes, on the one hand, it is subjected to its citizens and it brings into reality their wishes. On the other hand, it has the supreme authority. So this is a new trend. And there is another trend we can see, that we see new models and old models that coexist, both archaic systems and modern systems. We we still see uh, the legal state and rule of law, and on the other hand, there are different models that exist in our society, such as uh, the right of the powerful, and added to that is a very thin layer of supranational elements and they work on a global scale and uh, ensure material progress of humanity on the whole, even though it is uneven and diverse. There are three research questions that are brought about by the pandemic. First, what are the mechanisms that will push the evolution of the global system? It used to be homogeneous and interlinked in terms of economy, but right now there are different changes that we've got to take into account. Secondly, how is the pandemic going to impact the uh, link between governments and societies in different types. There are authoritarian regimes and democratic regimes and what differences are going to be. And also the third question is how do we ensure that globalization goes on smoothly and how it is going to 
come up against new factors. If we look at the first question, then we can maintain that coronavirus is a watershed, but not between different international orders, but between different views of globalization. On the one hand, the view of globalization as a linear process, and another view of globalization as a fragile system, which is based on factors we cannot always influence ourselves. So, globalization has to be verified, but right now we see that it is something we need, even though there are many disadvantages to it. And this is a paradigm shift which is going to bring about pro-globalization views once the post-COVID normality gets back. And we do do not think that it is going to have uh, a significant shift in uh, the role of government because the basic parameters are still the same. The world order is not going to undergo any changes like it used to be back in the 19th century or the 20th century. There is not going to be any big redistribution of uh, uh, roles and power between different states and governments. So even though the pandemic has had a great impact on the world, I do not think it is going to transform the world politically, even though, indeed, in some polities, the pandemic is probably going to bring about significant changes. Now, if we look inside governments, inside nations, we see that the pandemic is going to consolidate autocracies, whereas weak democracies will shift towards authoritarianism and there is going to be an erosion of democracy, like we saw in certain countries where civil rights were very much restricted and additional powers were assumed by the government. There are different examples, and we can see that governments can introduce restrictive measures just as fast as they introduce them, and they can lift them just as fast. Right now, we can see that the diplomacy of vaccines, diplomacy of medicine has become yet another tool and the toolkit of governments, it'll play a role in bringing certain governments uh, closer together, those governments that can mobilize resources to uh, accomplish goals within a short time frame. This is going to be very important. It becomes evident that the government is going to become far more powerful. The government is going to once again claim the role of of development institutions. There are going to be new tools that will address the unevenness of development. I would like to thank our third speaker. And finally, our third speaker, Marina Butovskaya, head of the Center of Cross Cultural Psychology and Etology of MAN at the Ethnology and Anthropology Institute of the Russian Academy of Sciences. We can see that the pandemic has transformed all aspects of our life. Uh, two years ago or so, we couldn't have imagined the state of affairs we would be in today. We see global restrictions on the mobility of people in side countries and between countries. Mass events have been shut down, restrictive measures have been introduced, and I refer to different events, scientific events, sports events, even family gatherings and friendly meetings have all been called into question. And 
even uh, saying goodbye to the loved ones that have passed away. Restrictions have been placed there too, but there is still a need for active contacts between, because they uh, reflect the very nature of our social nature of humanity. We, we need to talk to our loved ones, to friends, to touch, to touch one another, especially uh, and embrace one another, especially during times of stress. But social distancing and self-isolation have uh, brought some changes to this uh, traditional interaction which only feeds our stress levels instead of alleviating them, especially affected are senior people and lonely people, their psychological state is exacerbated due to that. There are traditional rules for welcoming one another and uh, fostering contacts among politicians and business partners. They have been a tradition, but due to the pandemic they have been called into question as well and they have undergone some changes. Right now, no one is surprised when people do not shake hands or embrace one another. No one is surprised when people are simply bumping their elbows or feet and the wearing the military wearing of a mask also has an impact on our mimics and how we interact with our faces facial expressions let me share with you a short analysis of our research on the conduct of people I mean the pandemic restrictions based on the Russian experience. We have assessed gender differences, family distance differences, age differences during the pandemic. On the whole, women are demonstrating a higher level of stress as compared to male. Even though, in principle, if we compare it to the norm, we usually see that men are also demonstrating a higher level of stress. A high level of anxiety is seen among people living in bigger families. So far the reasons are not clear, maybe because people are caring about loved ones and they are anxious for their well-being and they might also be anxious about themselves because the chances of contracting COVID are higher in a big family because more people are circulating, coming and going and the chances of contracting COVID are bigger. Lonely women have been demonstrating greater activity. They were venturing farther from home than men. If we look at families, as we can see, men have been demonstrating greater activity, taking the burden and the responsibility of uh, winning the bread, during the lockdown. We believe that this trend can be explained by the revival of traditional stereotypes, like the stereotype of a breadwinner among men who have families amid the general stress and anxiety. And we see that the lockdown and social distances had a positive correlation to stress among women and uh, the uh, reverse proportion among men. Social integration and the need for communication, these are the most important specific traits of uh, humanity. During the first wave of the pandemic, many people were suffering because they missed personal communication and women found lockdown a tougher and more arduous uh, tribulation than men. Even though many people labor under the delusion that young people live in social networks, the lockdown demonstrated that young people need live communication just as much as older people. Our young respondents told us that the most difficult thing they had experienced was lack of communication, personal communication, live communication with their friends. 
нормального поведения граждан. Masks and social distances usually demonstrate responsible behavior of our citizens. According to our data, masks are most often used by those citizens that demonstrated the same responsibility with regard to social distancing. And we also see a correlation between wearing a mask and complying with the recommended social distance. Cross-cultural research of behavioral norm during the pandemic has also revealed some differences. As we can see, the fight against the spread of the coronavirus as carried out more efficiently, more successfully, if society has collectivist proclivities, whereas individualistic societies and cultures see some very negative incidents because citizens are ignoring or neglecting the requirements and the recommendations of the government in terms of wearing masks or social distancing. The world is looking forward to the return of normality, looking forward to getting back to its normal life. But the experience that we've learned from the pandemic is invaluable. And we've got to learn the useful lessons from this experience. And we should remember that in the face of such threats, the whole of humanity is vulnerable. Thank you for your attention. I would like to thank our speakers. So we have listened to four different points of view, views of the pandemic, the issues they have brought about and what the consequences are. Since uh, you are specialists in different fields, I would like to ask general questions and to ask you to answer them. The first question is as follows. This is probably the first time in human history that we see such mass protective measures. Where does this uh, love for a human being comes from? Why this love for human life? Because the structures of uh, power, government, uh, bodies, uh, why did they come to love uh, human life and cherish it so? Where does this humanism come from? Well, this is a very good question, I would say. But to be honest, I don't think that humanism per se is the source of these measures. I think the nature of this phenomenon is different. It is more like a knee-jerk reaction. To be honest, this is not the first pandemic humanity is facing. When all of this happened, I studied the history of the Black Plague. Incidentally, it came from the same areas that the new infection has come from. It was somewhere near the Yangtze River and uh, it crept across Europe at a slower pace, but still it engulfed the whole continent. So these protective measures I do not mean to protect those who are ill, but to protect those who have not yet contracted the disease. I'll pick up where Sergei has left off. I believe this reaction was predictable and anticipated because all countries simply reacted as per the recommendations of virologists and uh, specialists on infectious diseases. No one contested those recommendations. The question is whether you totally agree with the recommendation or not, because uh, during the Black Plague, the density of population was uh, different. I think right now what helped us was uh, digital technologies and also remote communication, which has become possible thanks to that. If we had not had that, I think the response of many countries would have been different. China has given all other countries a chance to think on how to proceed. Epidemiologists have told us how to act 
and this situation. So, not humanitarian bodies, but uh, more forceful bodies of uh, governments were prepared for that, and of course many people were afraid of contracting the disease because we do not did not know what we were up against, what this disease was about. I think now the paradigm is a little different. Psychologists have done their job as well. They managed to prevent this state of mind from degenerating into a general depression. As Vladimir has aptly said, all of this was disguised and they wrapped as humanism, as love for humankind, even though there were other factors involved as well. Well, uh, question to you, and uh, uh, if you look at the response and the attitudes in social networks and on social media, it's obvious that confidence with uh, the governmental information is not always criticized, is seldom criticized. But at the same time, the, the trust with the official authorities is not high. How can we maintain a decent level of confidence? Thank you for the question. I, I think that it has several aspects. A source of uh, unanimity of approaches, unevenness of approaches, is that now we're seeing a global social space with transborder communications, and uh, the state cannot ignore that like practices applied in one country may be applied in other countries as well. Second, uh, over the past several decades, the mechanism of influencing the behaviors of national governments by national organizations was shaped. There are some of the international stakeholders that are the opinion leaders because of the efficiency, or, or it is uh, probably the roles played by international organizations. The third aspect is that any unpredictable and uncertain situation requires some reliable protection that will yield good results, and uh, most countries followed suit of those who faced COVID earlier than them. And the trust is not universal. It is mostly about personal inconveniences and constraints on personal freedom, but the mass obedience by law, which, which is a token of social and personal responsibility, is conscientious choice of people to accommodate the governmental requirements and the government seeing their requirements legitimized, became more self-confident and can manage social behaviors and patterns of conduct better and more efficiently, and they tweak their potential and fine-tune the Toolkit. Thank you. Marina, a question to you. You spoke about the, the, the high value of the epidemic. Uh, what lessons we must learn? What do you think? What are the key takeaways from the pandemic? First of all, the, the high value of people to people communication and interaction. It is personified, personal interaction. I can touch a person when it's a face-to-face -face contact, and I'm pleased to say that as when I deliver lectures to students, we all know that they are a new ensuing generation, they all live on social media, so this is their natural environment. My students start 
которые, собственно, и связаны, и они сами ее отстаивали. Она не нужна, потому что для человека нужна персонификация, такая вот персонификация взаимодействий, личности. Давай о котором я хотела сказать, и, наверное, очень важно, что люди должны задумываться о том, что не только общество для нас, но и мы для общества, и мы должны все-таки понимать, что смертный индивидуализм, он к нам не Excessive individualism would be no good, and there are different types of states, collective states, individualist states, existent worldwide. But any, anyway, anyway, collective interaction, joining hands is important. The third takeaway is. А именно, что существуют general, некие глобальные вызовы всему человечеству. И вот ковид уже глобальный вызов. И вот ковид уже глобальный вызов. На уровне государств. Плохо, хорошо. Uh, Какие-то попытки делать замечания like по государствам или искать достатки в той политике, в которой были бы государства. Сейчас неуместно. Is unbidden now, and the war vac uh, vaccines is also uncalled for currently and in general. And everybody must be vaccinated, and the availability, accessibility of vaccines is the must be the priority and prerogative of the governments. The more people are vaccinated, the better. That will near the end of the pandemic. We are close to finalize the roundtable, listening to all the interventions and answers to the questions by the panelists. We may come to one simple conclusion. The pandemic has a humanitarian dimension, many of these, and all of these require our focus requires research and we should learn the lessons so that we preclude that from happening in future and turning into something horrendous. I hope that our center that we all represent will keep on studying that topic and in a year's time or in two years time we will tell you more what a psychological or humanitarian dimension of an epidemic means and we'll be able to unveil terrific findings and outcomes to fight epidemics better. Thank you.
изменились ли мы? Стали другими или остались собой? Принимая время, место, обстоятельства. Главное не остановиться сегодня, чтобы стать сильнее завтра. И знать, мы вместе. И это все меняет. Ваш Газпромбанк. или в тексте, ушами или глазами, но всегда мозгами. Только по делу. Главное в политике, главное в бизнесе, главное о личных деньгах. Со скоростью звука, со скоростью света. Услышать и увидеть. Один бренд, два адреса. Бизнес FM и bfm.ru Не на словах, а на деле. В Российской Академии Народного Хозяйства и Государственной Службы при президенте Российской Федерации проходит Гайдаровский форум, который в начале года традиционно задает вектор общественной и научной дискуссии. Здесь собираются известные эксперты, представители органов власти, общественные и политические деятели, предприниматели из разных стран мира. Гайдаровский форум открывает обсуждение деловой повестки на ближайший год. Для гостей из-за рубежа форум выступает важным источником информации о главных тенденциях социально-экономического и политического развития, состояния бизнес-среды и инвестиционного климата России. В ходе открытых и плодотворных дискуссий участники форума смогут обменяться положительным опытом и лучшими мировыми практиками, предложить конструктивные подходы к решению приоритетных ключевых задач, стоящих перед Россией и миром на старте нового года, нового десятилетия. Ключевая тема форума этого года – Россия и мир после пандемии. Какие уроки мы извлекли с 2020 года, что нас ждет после пандемии и как мы можем подготовиться к этим изменениям? Станет ли дистанционная занятость будущей моделью рынка труда? 
как ограничения и принятые в условиях пандемии законы повлияют на права и свободы граждан. Кто является реальным бенефициаром пандемии в долгосрочной перспективе, а также глобальные вызовы десятилетия и национальные приоритеты России. Эти и многие другие вопросы будут обсуждаться экспертами форума. Смотрите прямые трансляции 14 и 15 января. Россия и мир после пандемии. Гайдаровский форум. Не пропустите.
Друзья, здравствуйте. Мы сегодня с вами в довольно необычном состоянии. Мы сегодня в этом студии в очень интересном Next to us on the left is Vladimir Mao, rector of Renipa. Next to me is Dmitry Kutov, founder and director general of Skillbox. My name is Maxim Spiridonov. I'm Justice Dmitry from the field of online education. And sitting to the right is the rector of the High School of Economics, Yaroslav Kuzminov. As you can see, on the one hand, we've got the representatives of education and its conservative traditional form, and on the other hand, we've got uh, ourselves, uh, young, um, that have come up with uh, new upstarts and segments which were unanticipated. I'm going to play two roles today. On the one hand, I participate in the discussion. On the other hand, I also perform the functions of uh, a moderator, because Marina Rakova that used to be Deputy Minister of Education. Well, she had some urgent business she had to attend to, and she couldn't participate in our session. I'm first going to direct my question to the two rectors. What is your view of us? If I were in your place, I think I would treat myself with irony on the one hand and with uh, prudence caution on the other. Well, let me tell you how they treated myself and Mao in the past. I had a friend from uh, the Moscow State University, I think it was uh, quite some time ago. There was uh, a picture, a gift uh, with uh, Mikhail Lomonosov. And on his uh, shelter there was uh, like a crow, the symbol of the High School of Economics. That was the gift to us. So you, you, you can see how they treated us. But right now we are presented and portrayed as the conservative wing of education. Well, I'm not afraid because you are still very far from research institutions. You are mostly working in the primary sector of education, and it is still quite a long way for you to, 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 to supplant us. And before that happens, uh, both I and Mao are going to be long dead. Well, we'll see. But from the very beginning, you see, there was no gender balance, as it were. You uh, introduced us by naming me and Mr. Kuzminov by our name and patronyme, and uh, you called Dmitry and yourself only by your first name. So why is that? That was a sign of respect. Well. Still, let me tell you something. Yaroslav has done a great job in his position, and right now a new education institution that used to be the High School of Economics became this uh, conservative institution, as it were, as you say. Let's have a look at our academy. Well, this, yeah, rather before that, uh, it was uh, 10 years, because this was set up in 2010. But the institution that was our predecessor was set up back in 1921. So virtually this year we're celebrating our centenary. So if you 
stop thinking and fighting with us, trying to compete with us. You are going to become a monster just like we are, but uh, a monster of conservatism, no, a uh, monster in the bad sense of the word. So the thing is, we're trying to enter the most promising areas. Yes, we've got school, education, and our folks food, but ontology, netology, skill box, we are teaching dozens of uh, thousands of uh, students that could have gone to the High School of Economics or to other tertiary education institutions, but instead they're going to us. So we're sort of uh, grabbing uh, promising professionals from you. Well, that's very good, I think. But I don't think you are robbing us of our students. We, we still have a great pool of students. And honestly, I don't want to offend you, but I do not feel much competition on your part so far. Because we've got a very wide field of playing. This is uh, mostly interdisciplinary competition. And as uh, German Graf says, uh, the main rival of a bank is not another bank, but high technology companies. So in the end, you're not going to be competing with us, but with banks that have uh, far bigger starting capital and resources. Well, it's popular among us to, to say that we are competing with uh, entertainment, with uh, games. Dmitry, so what is your view of our relationship as uh, upstarts in the market with uh, universities. I think we should not put ourselves in opposition to anyone. And it is our problem. We often say that we are in opposition to this or that, we are rivaling with this or that, but we are simply different. We are only beginning to work with RENIPA, we have launched a bachelor's degree with the High School of Economics, we are working with it too. So the most important thing is that we can enrich the traditional academic institutions, such as universities and institutes, we can offer them our technologies. First and foremost, uh, marketing, commercial technologies. I think this is going to help universities to make some amendments to their syllabi, to their methodologies, to their programs. And in this collaboration, we're going to promote a very important idea which is the idea of conscious paid education. It's evident that it's normal to pay for your education, but still many of us have grown accustomed to free of charge education. And this is something that can move us forward. And the third thing, I think in three years or so, we will work together and develop technological educational platforms will think about how these platforms can help both the teacher and the student, how to change the trajectory of education to make it, this trajectory truly flexible. So far, the system is not flexible enough. It's important for us to learn how to work together with one another and to create sort of a legal field that is going to validate the activities of companies that are working with universities. I think we're sitting at one table right now, and it's important to learn how to work together. We're working with uh, the High School of Economics, and we are working with education institutions, universities too. Yes, I think this opposition mostly only exists in the mind of external spectators, whereas we inside are willing to engage in collaboration. And Yaroslav, uh, what do you think the the most promising field looks like is marketing education, and we've made great headway in that regard. Skillbox is doing a great job in that regard too, and other players in this segment, in this field, are also very far advanced. 
So in this hypothetical collaboration, what else can you learn from us, can we offer you? What is valuable in your view? I think as much I can add to what you've just said. There is the field of ranking, of assessment. What do you mean? Assessment, assessment of knowledge, assessment of competences at any level. Say, you study microeconomics, and you need to be assessed at any given moment by someone. So what did the school do? We basically outsourced the teaching of English. You can come to the High School of Economics with a certificate issued by an external institution, and we're going to, to recognize that. So the main difference between you and us is not whether it is paid education or education that is free of charge, something old or something new. The thing is, we, you and we, represent basically different services. You provide and services. What can be dubbed an education service. It is indeed sold and people pay them consciously. Like a will for Mercedes. It's not like they trust what you offer. They choose what you offer from different options. This is the market principle. But on the market, what exists is long-term relations, long-term services. When you apply to a university, or to school, you do it because you have trust in the organization you apply to. You come to an institution that will shape you and you put your trust in this team. And it doesn't matter what you learned at the faculty at the Moscow State University. You can have one specialization or another. It can be applied mathematics or general physics. It's important that you graduate from a certain institution. A person who graduated from RENIPA has graduated from RENIPA under the Russian president. And it's not just the knowledge or competences. There's also the spirit. And a person who graduated from the High School of Economics is also a certain kind of person. It is a person who managed to overcome one's own weaknesses. If you graduated from the High School of Economics, you have graduated from this institution and your employer knows that. And it doesn't matter what you learned. Does it mean that all universities are like that? No. There are universities that simply provide you with uh, a diploma and no sense of uh, belonging. They do not shape you. They only give you a piece of paper, unlike certain institutions like ours. And as far as our opportunities of collaboration are concerned, I think there are many, and I think we can transfer to you half of our courses, like outsource them. Okay, I get that. I'll try to act as a moderator, Yaroslav has said, and I agree with that. There is the reputation, the, the educational brand, like the brand of Renipa or the High School of Economics. This is something which is well-renowned and well-respected. There are fundamental competences, fundamental knowledge that you give and we don't. So, what is this uh, potential collaboration we're trying to come up with? The thing is, the system is becoming increasingly specialized. And universities are supposed to provide all elements that are required for education. 
What was bad about the Volsky car factory? It tried to produce everything, starting from metal to wheels, to rubber, to metal sheets. Maybe it was okay for the mid-20th century, but it was absolutely not okay for the end of the 20th century, because there was specialization which was far more efficient. You become part of manufacturing cooperation. So, some of your platforms can rise and grow and become a comprehensive educational institution. A university is not about education, it's about fundamental knowledge, fundamental science and scholarly research. A university, a tertiary education, education uh, institution, is not about students. It is also about a mass of people who do what they do because they're interested in that, not because someone puts their trust in them. And these are people who are interested in what they're doing. And it is the core of the system that attracts the student. So it's about the environment. Well, some American and business schools say that jokingly, of course, that uh, we are a great school, the only thing that uh, doesn't make us entirely happy is the students, uh, we would be okay with those, those, but it's just part of the joke. So what you provide as online platforms, as educational platforms, applied competences, so your goal is different. Your role is very important, because this lifelong training, lifelong education, Education implies such a process. Sometimes you have to, to buy just one single function. You don't need the whole car. You need just one spare part. And you buy this spare part. And it's the same with education. Sometimes a little a car uh, workshop can become a car factory. Sometimes a car factory goes bankrupt. It's normal. So you are ready for turbulence in education and you are ready for change. I'd say as follows. I see you as, I view you as partners, not as competitors, as rivals. No, no, no. You, you just asked whether we are afraid, but you know, for me, you are more of a partner. We have other competitors, formidable ones that can provide the same range of services much cheaper. But you know, you are a potential source of our positive transformation, external transformation. Dmitry, you have case studies of how to build collaborations with uh, universities, including those represented here. What would be the optimal scenario currently and in the forthcoming three years? I think that it is important to stop counterpoising the personal or face-to-face -face and the remote education. And these collaboration, collaborations will help sort out who is in charge of what. One of the big problems is that we don't have a clear understanding of the values underlying the uh, education process or a course. Why are we successful? Because we are clear about our values. You will receive a wheel from a Mercedes, and, and this is something people want. And I'm in agreement with Vladimir. We have been doing education and uh, universities are kind of filters and it is important for us to enrich each other data-wise, methodologies-wise and the pandemic brings us closer, closer towards each other and that is good. One year ago we wouldn't have had this dialogue. And uh, what would be ideal in future? Well, the mechanisms of interaction between uh, private educational companies and universities are not always transparent. So there should, we should speak about limitations 
put on iTech. Being technology platforms, we do education, but at the same time we don't do education. What is this new education about? And currently being the Skolkova residence, together with you, we are to bring it up. Over the three years, I think we should become clear about what the new format of education is and what is blended education. And we probably will sort out the remote bachelor's courses and uh, want to edge closer towards a public awareness that is normal to have this blended format of education. This has already happened, I cannot say so. Well, many people expect the end of the pandemic, wanting to weather that. But will it come back to as it was? I don't think so. You know, we had had all those technologies prior to the start of the pandemic. You know, education is a conservative thing. It's extremely conservative. Because the DNA of education is passing over, passing down the knowledge that had been accumulated before. This is what education is hardwired to do. Maintain and pass down. This is the function of education. No, preserve and pass down. And currently, Many people start applying remote education and virtual meetups and teleconferencing. They are engaged in all that. And I think that unlike in the past, it, it was not necessary to come up with new things. Now you can do without those who cling to the past. Novelty prevails. So, is there a conflict between the online and offline education patterns? Because this is a popular talk. Is there any warfare between online and offline courses? Uh, Does it have to do with the war, with warfare? Uh, well, schools are obliged to operate off online, they have to. There are some public groups that believe that online education is devil incarnate. Well, they have grounds to believe that online, online school education is a scourge because school is also about upbringing, not only about educating. And an online school is inferior to a normal one because there is less chance to socialize. And, uh, the potential for upbringing is much lower. The overall process of shaping an adult personality via the micro-society. Micro Socializing, which is the main thing. And in the first year, we try to have personal and on offline lectures. Well, so the protesters against online school education have some grounds to say so, but you know, no one will do that permanently. And there is another point about the role of contemporary teachers Pedagogues. Well, the fact that 
онлайн-обучение в этом во многом, ну, не вина, а заслуга, если хотите, and, uh, школьные учителя, которые были достаточно грамотны в этом смысле, и недостаточно готовы к тому, что системы класса станут прозрачными, по сути дела, и нужно well, онлайн-обучение. Ready for the transparent classroom walls. Are they capable enough to work in all the formats, online and offline? You know, there are no universal professionals. I think that it is much more difficult, like schools, And parents, там домашние гувернёры, ради мамы, которая дома с ребёнком. И some families have есть специальная комната, home tutors and teachers, and they have есть там, где родители работают, вообще не rooms for each of the children in the family, in high-income families. Other families have one and the same computer on the same PC, the household. So there is stratification. And to a certain extent, this pandemic has been equalizing all of us, and you can receive good education online, remotely, but at the same time, it adds up to the stratification, because some people can afford that, others can't. We all remember internet cafes, they now have become useless. But you know, if we want to have real remote education, we should have outlets and spaces where children may use computers, PCs for education free of charge or at a very low price. So we need to build infrastructure to help the needy ones providing them the enabling conditions. They may not have a separate room for each child and a separate PC at home. And what about the subject of learning, the person? No, no, I, I'll tell you about that a bit later. The first thing to remember is that there are good and bad educational establishments. Some of the universities have good reputation. This is why the remote education patterns, despite lacking the socialization opportunities, is still good. We have had intramural and extramural education in the past. And now we have this distant education. And us, the stakeholders, major stakeholders of uh, educational market, we, we should maintain the good level of education. It should not become extramural. A distant education is not extramural. So, and what is your vision of the state of the art of contemporary teacher or pedagogue. So it is about tutoring, tutoring, mentoring, it's about data analytics, it's about visualizing content, it's about motivating students. So the role of teachers has changed. So the role of education professionals should be revisited and reconsidered, and this, this profession must become trendy again, must become fashionable. We should come back to the point where being a university teacher or a lecturer was a trendy thing. Currently we have ambitious plans and I'll unveil them. We want to have 10,000 new programming teachers in Russia, software development teachers, and for that only distant education, remote education, will not suffice. We need socialization, we need the environment, we need face-to-face -face contact. So currently the role of a 
очень Teachers. сильно рефлексируется. Но э, в школе там, это, a... это вынуждено, потому что преподаватели просто не справляются. И тот, Something... который придет, он, он, идет, он несправедлив по отношению к преподавателям, я считаю. Это проблема, Education officials must help teachers to deliver good services. But switching from my moderator role to my uh, panelist role, I must say that I think it is a nationwide problem. There is not enough toolkit and motivation for millions of teachers to retrain and get all the necessary equipment, get re-equipped and embrace new practices have the motivation to become an inspiration for, for their students. I think that now there is a real need for that and we should have this motivation instilled in a top-down fashion. But you know, many, many education professionals just try to balk that and step aside. What about the, the public officials, the government, the public sector? I think that the government still is constructive. The state may turn a blind eye to many things, like the digital uh, methodology sets and kits initiative that could have helped to resolve a very important issue failed. It was a flop. Teachers may be different, but teachers may do creative work as well as routines. Their routines today come to the fore. They prevail. And they don't have neither time nor opportunity for creativity. And these digital systems must help free the time of the teachers for, for them to become creative. And goal setting is an important thing, is an important function of teachers. And over the past two years we haven't reached any considerable, any major progress. So the government is short-sighted, the state is short-sighted. It lacks understanding and awareness about obvious things, but the priorities by Chadaev and Kravtsov are correct ones, because they try to handle to tackle the first goal, they will bring internet to each and every school. Otherwise, all our tricks and stunts and uh, ploys about eliminating the routines will not work because everybody needs internet access now to be able to study, to learn. So in the first two years, the government, in, in the forthcoming two years, the state is to walk the final mile and uh, provide internet access in each and every school. Well, yes, the, the, the state is now moving in the right direction. Okay. The pandemic had a lot of episodes of communication between public officials and common people. I talked with many deputy ministers and uh, top officials and they were engaged, and they were sincere. But at the later stage, the, the frankness and sincerity disappeared. At the start of the pandemic, everybody was frightened, but it fizzled out later. It's the first time you are attending the Gaida Forum, probably. Not, not, not the first time. You know, I, 
when I, when I get in touch with the government, with the state, I am frustrated always. You know, now we are opening up new avenues for our work. The government will have to open schools for private education companies that will probably serve as operators. So the access of private companies will help enhance the quality of education dramatically. And within one or two or three years, we will be there. As we are now seeing that we start interacting within the academic institutions and we are to serve as the role model probably. This, the state has done a lot to allow us to do our business. At least they are not killing this hand, yes, you are right. So, Thank God we can have this dialogue today, and I, I hope that this year we will be able to launch 15 programs of interaction with universities in our market. Peers will launch another 20 to 30. A year ago we had zero programs, but you know, Yaroslav, we are talking not about the state, but about the education officials. They have their own role to play and function to perform. Don't dramatize. But anyway, I may be obsolete in my perceptions, but I may say that the government should not hassle, which is the main thing. And the second thing is to, to help. Like fancy that things have changed and parents switched and migrated to online schools. It is the buzz of everybody and it, is, it becomes a widespread practice and the licenses are issued. Just fancy that. A bylaw, well, by the by, was issued not long ago. So we still have some, some headway. Here. We are pressed for time. Let's talk about the education products. Everybody thinking about what education is may say, well, well myself being a CEO of an education holding catering to kids and adults alike. We care for strategy, but what is the education of the future, we ask ourselves. We should have the single concept and we should move in one and the same direction. I, I will now read out some of the working documents of ours that will show you how we see the education of the future. I'll be brief, even though it's quite detailed. First, this education is going to be based on individual approach to each and every student, depending on uh, some individual capabilities. Uh, and also, it has to be split into self-sustained fragments, because people sort of educate right now in leaps and bounds, not in a linear fashion. It also has to be more engaging and interactive, because sometimes you sort of have to compete with Netflix or Ivy or a game. It also has to be accompanied, at least so far. In other words, there has to be some accompaniment like gamification or some competition, and there also has to be personal involvement of a person accompanying you along this road and helping you with the difficulties. And it also has to be based on a cross-platform approach. So smartphone, smart TV, a computer, there has to be seamless transition from one device to another so that you could integrate that into your life conveniently. What do you think about that? I think I mostly agree with everything. The issue of school is 
that it is a platform of socialization. School is in crisis not because it is outdated, because you've got to change the syllabus for literature or for physics. School is obsolete in terms of not giving the proper feedback. If a person comes to school to study, it is based on trust. Yes, it requires a great deal of trust, and every parent knows that. So you give your child to school, and uh, the children begin to invest. They get some feedback at primary education, but once they hit secondary school, when there are different specialists, uh, specialized teachers like uh, geography teacher or mathematics teacher, then at least in half of the classes, the child ceases to get feedback from the teachers. And this issue has to be addressed. All the issues, all, all the things you've mentioned, they need to seek to raise the level of feedback for each and every pupil to provide assessment, to give attention to how well the child is coping. It should not be just your grandmother at home that gives you some feedback. No, you've got to get this feedback and this assessment of your accomplishments at school. 8% of GDP in the West is spent on education. We are only spending 3%. Vladimir and I have been fighting to make sure that we spend at least 4.55% on education, but it turns out other parts of our society are far more convincing than we are, than the education sector. But even despite these difficulties, these challenges, we have to find opportunities to make education more efficient. And we can only teach better if we provide the teacher at school with a digital assistant and it will address a whole host of issues such as multiple trajectories for your education but so far the basic issue has not been addressed if your child does not feel that anyone needs him or her at school if he understands that no one checks his home assignment that there is no feedback well and sometimes the geography teacher doesn't love his or her subject themselves, yes. Just as Yaroslav, I agree with everything you have said, and there is a lot more you can add to that. But let me try to provide you with a different angle, just as I did with your question about teachers. The thing is, we're trying to teach, but it's impossible to teach. It is only, um, only, only possible to learn. You can lead the horse to uh, water, but you cannot make the horse drink it. So, for me, the fundamental, most important issue is where the demand for education comes from. And of course we need to make sure that this demand is satisfied domestically, because there is a risk that people who are in need of good education will simply try to get education somewhere else, abroad. And education is very dynamic, and the landscape is dynamic. But what do we do to improve the demand? It's a systemic issue, but it goes beyond the scope of education sector per se. Say, when business says, you are not training the right specialists for us, I respond sometimes cynically, but it's true, you do not create demand for good specialists, that's what I respond, and unfortunately that's the case, that's the crux of the matter, how do we make people want to learn, not make them want to get a diploma, but want to learn truly and genuinely.
What do we do to make people want to invest in their education? Because education is investment. They need to see some return. That's a social issue that is far more complex and complicated. Unfortunately, we have to be more succinct because we have just a couple of minutes left. Just very briefly, what do you think about what comes next? What are the prospects? What are you expecting in the coming two to three years in education? Dmitry, you're going to be the first. I think in the next several years we will see business ever more interested in investing in education because for many education is no longer just uh, some uh, philanthropic activity. It's no longer seen as charity. It can be a business with a very good project and product and it can have investment potential and I think we're going going to see private capital flow in and we will see collaboration between private institutions and universities, public ones. And it is a good trend. And I think it's important to keep talking, not competing. And I think this is going to be the wonderful thing. It will give us a high technology and methodological product in several years. Yaroslav, what do you think, very briefly, your forecast for the next two to three years? What are we going to witness? What is the most important and interesting thing? First, we will witness a rapid development of market for concrete specialized education products which you represent you are not going to be the only ones SPK world skills mm -hmm. so what we call micro degrees as it were and in that sense both universities and schools with a certain lag we will they will portray themselves as a platform for socializing for developing a human person and people will be able to get education products from you or from others from Harvard if they want. But universities and school will highlight the element that shapes the human person. Vladimir, what do you think? Of course, I think education is going to be increasingly diversified, which is important to adapt to new challenges, to acquire the necessary competences. In the midterm, the value of uh, education that provides you with a diploma is going to go down. It'll only be kind of a sign that a person can learn for four years to get a bachelor's degree. The capability to concentrate is very important. Not everyone who drops out of school becomes Bill Gates. Mostly simply drink themselves into oblivion or stop doing anything productive if they cannot study for four years. And the role of private money is also going to grow. In the 1990s, there was a greater share of uh, paid education because the government was uh, short on money. But right now, it's different. If the government has more money, private money is also going to flow into education because the basic needs have already been met. So our goal will be to make sure that this education is happening inside the country because this is another thing to invest into. And in the end, I'd like to add what my colleagues said. I've been thinking what is important, and I think we upstarts in education, people who came into the field just a couple of years ago, uh, familiarized them, themselves with that, saw new opportunities, came up with new solutions. I think we have this opportunity to kind of provide a very good addition to uh, the academic traditional education. The most important task at hand is to find a synthesis 
of uh, these two types of education and give a start to uh, grand processes that can be born out of it. The new solutions combined with uh, time-tested methodologies, if they're combined, it's going to be great. Thank you very much. That was a wonderful introduction too. Thank you. That was perfect.